The Throwback by Tom Sharp Read by Simon Callow It could be said of Lockhart Flaws when he carried his bride, Jessica, nay Sandicott, across the threshold of twelve Sandicott Crescent, East Pursley, Surrey, that he was entering into married life with as little preparedness for its hazards and happiness as he had entered the world at five past seven on Monday the 6th of September 1956, promptly killing his mother in the process. Since Miss Flaws had steadfastly refused to name his father, even on the stinging metals that composed her deathbed, and had spent the hour of his delivery and her departure alternatively wailing and shouting, Great Scott! It had devolved upon his grandfather to name the infant Lockhart after the great Scott's biographer, and at some risk to his own reputation to allow Lockhart to assume the surname Flaws for the time being. From that moment Lockhart had been allowed to assume nothing, not even a birth certificate. Old Mr. Flaws had seen to that. If his daughter had been so obviously devoid of social discretion as to give birth to a bastard under a dry stone wall while out cub hunting, which dry stone wall her horse had, more sensibly than she refused, Mr. Flaws was determined to ensure that his grandson grew up with none of his mother's faults. He had succeeded. At eighteen, Lockhart knew as little about sex as his mother had known or cared about contraception. His life had been spent under the care of several housekeepers and later half a dozen tutors, the former chosen for their willingness to endure the bed and board of old Mr. Flaws, and the latter of their otherworldliness. It was largely a consequence of the departure of his latest and most desirable housekeeper that old Mr. Flaws was urged by his personal physician, Dr. McGrew, to take a holiday. The doctor was supported by Mr. Bulstrode, the solicitor, at one of the monthly dinners at Flaws Hall, which the old man had given for thirty years, and which allowed him a forum for those vociferous disputations on things eternal, metaphysical, biological, and generally slanderous. Damn the farewell, he said, when Dr. McGrew first mooted the idea of a holiday. And the fool who first said a change is as good as a rest doesn't live in this benighted century. Dr. McGrew helped himself to the port. You can't live in an unheated house without a housekeeper or expect to last another winter. I've got Dodd and the bastard to look after me. And the house isn't unheated. There's coal in the drift mine up slumbering and Dodd brings it down. And that's another thing, said Dr. McGrew, who rather suspected that Lockhart had cooked their dinner. You can't expect to keep the boy cooped up here forever. It's time he saw something of the world. Mr. Flaws stared into the depths of the decanter and considered the proposition. There was something in what his friends advised, and besides, Lockhart was eighteen, and it was high time he got shot at the lad. I'll leave the arrangements to you, Bulstrud, he said, as he finished his coffee and lit a blackened pipe, and the bastard will go with me. The Ludlow Castle sailed down the Solent. Old Mr. Flaws dined in his stateroom, and it was Lockhart, dressed conspicuously in tails and white tie, which had once belonged to a larger uncle, who made his way up to the first-class dining saloon, and was conducted to a table at which sat Mrs. Sandicott and her daughter Jessica. For a moment, stunned by Jessica's beauty, he hesitated, then bowed and sat down. Lockhart Flaws had not fallen in love at first sight. He had plunged. One look at this tall, broad-shouldered young man who bowed, and Jessica knew she was in love. But if with the young couple it was love at first sight, with Mrs. Sandicott it was calculation at second. Lockhart's appearance in white tie and tails and his general air of incoherent embarrassment had a profound effect upon her, and when during the meal he managed to stammer that his grandfather was dining in their stateroom, Mrs. Sandicott's suburban soul thrilled to the sound. Your stateroom? she asked. You did say your stateroom? Yes, mumbled Lockhart. Uh, You you see, he's ninety, and the journey from the hall fatigued him. The hall, murmured Mrs. Sandicott, and looked significantly at her daughter. Uh, Floors, all, said Lockhart. It's the family seat. And your grandfather's really ninety, Lockhart nodded. It's amazing that such an elderly man should be taking a cruise at his time of life, continued Mrs. Sandicott. Doesn't his poor wife miss him? I really don't know. My grandmother died in 1935, said Lockhart, and Mrs. Sandicott's hopes rose even higher. By the end of the meal, she had winkled the story of Lockhart's life from him, 
And with each new piece of information, Mrs. Sandicott's conviction grew that at long, long last, she was on the brink of an opportunity too good to be missed. What a very nice young man, she said. Such charming manners and so well brought up. Jessica said nothing. She did not want to spoil the savour of feelings by revealing them. She had been overwhelmed by Lockhart, but in a very different way to her mother. If Lockhart represented a social world to which Mrs. Sandicott aspired, to Jessica he was the very soul of romance. And romance was all in all to her. She had listened to his description of Floor's Hall on Floor's Fell, close under Floor's Rig, and had garnished each word with the new significance that came from the romantic novel with which she had filled the emptiness of her adolescence. It was an emptiness that amounted to vacuity. At eighteen, Jessica Sandicott was endowed with physical charms beyond her control, and an innocence of mind that was both the fault and despair of her mother. To be more precise, her innocence resulted from the late Mr. Sandicott's will, in which he had left all twelve houses in Sandicott Crescent to my darling daughter Jessica on her reaching the age of maturity. To his wife, he bequeathed Sandicott and partner, chartered accountants and tax consultants of Wheedle Street in the City of London. But the late Mr. Sandicott's will had bequeathed more than these tangible assets. It had left Mrs. Sandicott with a sense of grievance and the conviction that her husband's premature death at the age of 45 was proof positive that she had married no gentleman. The proof of his ungentlemanliness lying in his failure to depart this world at least ten years earlier, when she was still at a reasonably remarriageable age, or, failing that, to have left her his entire fortune. From this misfortune, Mrs. Sandicott had formed two resolutions. The first was that her next husband would be a very rich man, with a life expectancy of as few years as possible, and preferably with a terminal illness. The second, to see that Jessica reached the age of maturity as slowly as a religious education could delay. So far, she had failed in her first objective, and only partly succeeded in her second. To protect her daughter from temptation, and to maintain her own financial income from the rents of the houses in Sandicott Crescent, Mrs. Sandicott had confined Jessica to her home and a correspondence course in typing. By the time Jessica reached 18, it was still impossible to say of her that she had reached the age of maturity. If anything, she had regressed. And while Mrs. Sandicott supervised the running of Sandicott and Partner, the partner being a Mr. Pryor, Jessica sank back into a literary slough of romantic novels populated entirely by splendid young men. In short, she lived in a world of her imagination, the fecundity of which was proven one morning when she announced that she was in love with the milkman and intended to marry him. Mrs. Sandicott determined otherwise, and promptly booked two tickets on the Ludlow Castle in the conviction that whatever else the ship might have to offer in the way of possible husbands for her daughter, they couldn't be less eligible than the milkman. Besides, she had herself to think of, and cruise liners were notoriously happy hunting grounds for middle-aged widows with an eye to the main trunk. But Mrs. Sandicott's own eye was fastened on an ancient and potentially terminal old man with money, only made the prospect of the voyage the more desirable. And Lockhart's appearance had heralded the mainest chance of all, an eligible and evidently half-witted young man for her idiot daughter, and in his stateroom a gentleman of ninety with an enormous estate in Northumberland. That night Mrs. Sandicott went to sleep, a cheerful woman. In the bunk above, Jessica sighed and murmured the magical words... Lockhart floors of Floor's Hall, on Floor's Fell, close under Floor's Rig. He formed a litany of floors to the religion of romance. On the boat deck, Lockhart leaned on the rail and stared out over the sea, his heart filled with feelings as turbulent as the white wake of the ship. He had met the most wonderful girl in the world, and for the very first time he realized that women were not simply unprepossessing creatures who cooked meals, swept floors, and having made beds, made strange noises in them late at night. There was more to them than that. But what that something more was, Lockhart could only guess. His knowledge of sex was limited to the discovery, made while gutting rabbits, that bucks had balls and does didn't. There appeared to be some connection between these anatomical differences that accounted for ladies having babies and men not. On one occasion he had attempted to explore the difference further by asking one of his tutors how Mizriat begat Ludin in Genesis 10, 13. He had received a clout across the ear that had temporarily deafened him and had given him the permanent impression that such questions were best left unasked. On the other hand, he was aware that there was such a thing as marriage and that out of marriage came families 
one of his distant Flaw's cousins had married a farmer from Elsdon and had subsequently raised four children. The housekeeper had told him as much, and no more, except that it had been a shotgun marriage which had merely deepened the mystery. Shotguns, in Lockhart's experience, being reserved for putting things to death rather than bringing them to life. To make matters even more incomprehensible, the only occasions on which his grandfather had permitted him to visit his relatives had been to their burials. Mr. Flaws enjoyed funerals immensely. They reinforced his belief that he was hardier than any other Flaws is, and that death was the only certainty. And so Lockhart had continued in ignorance of the facts of life, while acquiring extensive knowledge of those of death. While leaning on the guard rail, staring down at the white foam in the moonlight, Lockhart expressed his feelings in images he knew best. He longed to spend the rest of his life shooting things and laying them at Jessica Sandicott's feet. This exalted notion of love, Lockhart went down to the cabin where old Mr. Flaws, clad in a red flannel nightgown, was snoring noisily and climbed into bed. If Mrs. Sandicott's expectations had been aroused by Lockhart's appearance at dinner, they were confirmed by old Mr. Flaws at breakfast. Dressed in a suit that had been out of fashion as far back as 1925, he cut a swathe through subservient waiters with an arrogance far older than his suit, and taking his place with a Good morning to you, ma'am, surveyed the menu with disgust. I want porridge, he told the head waiter, who hovered nervously, and none of your half-boiled mush. Oats, man, oats. Yes, sir, and what to follow? A double ration of eggs and bacon, and find some kidneys, said Mr. Flaws, to the prognostic delight of Mrs. Sandicott, who knew all there was to know about cholesterol. And by double, I mean double. Four eggs and a dozen rashers, then toast and marmalade and two large pots of tea. And the same goes for the boy. The waiter hurried away with this lethal order, and Mr. Flaws looked over his glasses at Mrs. Sandicott and Jessica. In the course of his long life, he had learned to smell a snob a mile off, and Mrs. Sandicott's deference suited him well. She would, he considered, make an excellent housekeeper. Better still, there was a daughter. She was clearly a gormless girl, and just as clearly an ideal match for his gormless grandson. Mr. Flaws observed Lockhart out of the corner of a watery eye, and recognized the symptoms of love. Mrs. Sandicott calculated Mr. Flaws to be exactly the man she had been waiting for, a nonagenarian with an enormous estate, and therefore an enormous bank account, and an appetite for just those items on the menu best suited to kill him off almost immediately. It was therefore with no affectation of gratitude that she accepted his offer of a stroll round the deck after breakfast. At the time they had covered the old man's statutory two miles, Mrs. Sandicott's breath had been taken away for other reasons. Mr. Flaws was not a man to mince his words, let me make myself plain, he said unnecessarily, as they took their seats in deck chairs. I am not given over to delaying my thoughts. You have a daughter of marriageable age, and I have a grandson who ought to be married. Am I right? I suppose you could say that, she said. Mr. Flaws, having baited the trap for another housekeeper, waited for Mrs. Sandicott's response. If Jessica were to marry, she said, I would be without a home. Oh, sure, ma'am. Mr. Flaws inquired. Because my poor dear late husband left all twelve houses in Sandicott Crescent, including our own, to our daughter, and I would never live with the young married couple. Mr. Flaws sympathized. There is always Flaws Hall, ma'am. You would be very welcome there. As what? A temporary guest? Or were you thinking of a more permanent arrangement? I would never consent to staying alone in a house with a man without there being some legal status to my being there. Legal status, ma'am, said Mr. Flaws. The bloody woman was proposing to him. I think you know what I mean, said Mrs. Sandicott. Mr. Flaws said nothing. The ultimatum was too clear. Mrs. Sandicott, he said with unaccustomed familiarity, am I right in supposing that it would not come averse to you to change your name to Mrs. Flaws? Mrs. Sandicott beamed her assent. It would make me very happy, Mr. Flaws, he said, and took his mottled hand. Then allow me to make you happy, ma'am, said the old man, with the private thought that once he'd got her up to Flaws Hall, she'd get her fill of happiness, one way or another. I must warn you that Lockhart will need employment, he said. I had always intended to keep him to manage the estate he will one day inherit, 
But if your daughter has twelve houses... Mrs. Sandicott came to his rescue. The houses are all let, and the rent's fixed by the rent tribunal on long leases, she said. But dear Lockhart could always join my late husband's accountancy firm. Mr. Flores congratulated himself on his foresight. Then that is settled, he said. There remains simply the question of the wedding. Weddings, said Mrs. Sandicott, emphasizing the plural. I see no reason why the captain shouldn't marry us, he said, finally. Mrs. Sandicott thrilled at the notion. It combined speed and no time for second thoughts with an eccentricity that was almost aristocratic. Then I'll see the captain about it in the morning, said Mr. Flaws, and it was left to Mrs. Sandicott to break the news to the young couple. She found them on the boat deck whispering together. For a moment she stood and listened. What she heard was both reassuring and disturbing. Oh, Lockhart. Oh, Jessica. You're so wonderful. So are you. Kiss me, darling. Where? said Lockhart. Here, yeah, said Jessica, and offered him her lips. There? said Lockhart. Are you sure? Isn't it a bit sticky? Oh, darling, you're so romantic, said Jessica. You really are. Mrs. Sandicott emerged from the shadows and bore down on them. That's quite enough of that, she said, as they staggered apart. When you're married, you can do whatever you like, but no daughter of mine is going to indulge in obscene acts on the boat deck of a liner. Besides, someone might see you. Jessica and Lockhart stared at her in amazement. It was Jessica who spoke first. When we're married? You really did say that, Mummy? I said exactly that, said Mrs. Sandicott. She and Jessica left Lockhart standing bemused on the boat deck. He was going to get married to the most beautiful girl in the world. For a moment he looked round for a gun to fire to announce his happiness, but there was nothing. In the end, he unhooked a life belt from the rail and hurled it high over the side into the water and gave a shout of joyful triumph. Then he too went down to his cabin, oblivious of the fact that he had just alerted the bridge to the presence of man overboard, and that in the wash of the liner the life belt bobbed frantically and its warning beacon glowed. As the engines went full astern and a boat was lowered, Lockhart sat on the edge of his bunk, listening to his grandfather's instructions. He was to marry Jessica Sandicott. He was to live in Sandicott Crescent, East Pursley, and start work at Sandicott and Partner. That's marvellous, he said when Mr. Flaws finished. I couldn't have wished for anything better. I could, said Mr. Flaws, struggling into his nightgown. I've got to marry the bitch of a mother to get rid of you. And so it was as the ship sailed towards the Cape of Good Hope, that Lockhart Flaws and Jessica Sandicott became Mr. and Mrs. Flaws, while Mrs. Sandicott achieved her long ambition of marrying a very rich old man with but a short time to live. Mr. Flaws, for his part, consoled himself with the thought that whatever disadvantages the ex-Mrs. Sandicott might display as a wife, he had rid himself once and for all of a bastard grandson while acquiring a housekeeper who need never be paid and never be able to give notice. If the world of Floors Hall on Floors Fell, close under Floors Rig, Northumberland, had played a large part in persuading Jessica that Lockhart was the hero she wanted to marry, the world of Sandicott Crescent, East Pursley, Surrey, had played no part in Lockhart's choice at all. Used as he was to the open moors of the border country, where the curlews, until he shot them, cried, Sandicott Crescent, a cul-de-sac of twelve substantial houses set in substantial gardens and occupied by substantial tenants with substantial incomes, was a world apart from anything he knew. Built in the thirties as an investment by the foresighted, if late, Mr. Sandicott, the twelve houses were bordered to the south by the Pursley Golf Course and to the north by the Bird Sanctuary, a stretch of gorse and birch whose proper purpose was less to preserve bird life than to maintain the property values of Mr. Sandicott's investment. The result was that the rates were enormous and rents fixed. Mr. Sandicott, for all his prudence, had not foreseen the rent tax and capital gains tax. Under the former, there was no way of evicting tenants or increasing the rent they paid to a financially profitable sum. Under the latter, the sale of a house earned more for the exchequer than it did for the owner. Together, the rent act and the tax nullified all Mr. Sandicott's provisions for his daughter's future. So the young couple started their married but unorthodox life. Each morning, Lockhart left the house, walked to the station, and caught the train to London. There, in the offices of Sandicott and Partner, he began his apprenticeship under Mr. Trier. From the start, there were difficulties. 
Income and asset protection, he told Lockhart, has a more positive ring to it than tax avoidance. And we must be positive. Lockhart took his advice, combined it with the positive simplicity his grandfather had adopted towards matters of income tax. Since the old man had transacted all possible business in cash, and had made a habit of hurling every letter from the income tax authorities into the fire without reading it, while at the same time ordering Mr. Bulstrode to inform the bureaucratic swine that he was losing money, not making it. Lockhart's adoption of his methods at Sandicott and Partners, while initially successful, was ultimately catastrophic. Mr. Trier had been delighted at first to find his in-tray so empty, and it was only his early arrival one morning to discover Lockhart using the toilet as an incinerator for all envelopes marked on Her Majesty's service that alerted him to the cause of the sudden cessation of final demands. Look, he said, as patiently as he could. From now on, I don't want you to go anywhere near those files. You or anyone else. Two days later, he had cause to regret his instructions. A series of terrible screams from the room which contained the value-added tax records sent him scurrying through to find an officer of the Customs and Excise VAT department trying to extricate his fingers from the drawer of a filing cabinet which Lockhart had slammed shut just as he was reaching for a file. Well... He told me not to let anyone go near those files, Lockhart explained, as the VAT man was led away to have four broken fingers attended to by a doctor. Mr. Trier stared at him frenziedly and tried to think of an adequate phrase to describe his detestation. Mr. Trier wrote to Mrs. Flores, threatening to resign unless Lockhart was removed from the firm. While waiting for a reply, he barred Lockhart from leaving his office except to relieve himself. But if Lockhart... To put it as mildly as modern parlance will allow, was having a job adjustment problem in Wheedle Street. His marriage proceeded as sweetly as it had started, and as chastely. What was lacking was not love. Lockhart and Jessica were passionlessly in love, but sex. The anatomical differences between males and females he had detected while gutting rabbits proved accurate in humans. He had balls, and Jessica didn't. Jessica had breasts, large ones at that. And he didn't, or only of the most rudimentary kind. To further complicate matters, when they went to bed at night and lay in one another's arms, he had an erection, and Jessica didn't. The fact that he also had what are crudely termed lover's balls, and spent part of the night in agony, he was too brave and gentlemanly to mention. They simply lay in one another's arms and kissed. What happened after that, he had no idea, and Jessica had no idea either. Lockhart loathed London, Mr. Trier, East Pursley, and everything about this insane, rotten world into which he had been launched by his marriage. The world was rotten and corrupt, and he longed to be back on floors fell with his rifle in his hands, some identifiable target between his sights, while his darling Jessica sat in the stone flag kitchen at the Black Iron Range, waiting for him to come home with their supper. And with that longing, there came the determination to make it come true. One of these days he would take on the whole rotten world and impose his will on it, come hell or high water, and then people would learn what it meant to cross Lockhart floors. In the meantime, he had to get home. For a moment, he thought of catching the bus, but it was only six miles to Sandicott Crescent, and Lockhart was used to covering thirty in a day across the grassy fells of the border country. With rage against everyone except Jessica and his grandfather and Mr. Dodd, Lockhart strode off down the street. At Flores Hall, the ex-Mrs. Sandicott shared none of Lockhart's feelings. She would have given anything, most specifically strychnine, to old Mr. Flores to be back in the cosy confines of Sandicott Crescent. Instead, she was trapped in a large, cold house on an empty wasteland where the snow lay deep and the wind howled incessantly with a horrid old man and his even more horrid gamekeeper come handyman, Mr. Dodd. The husband's horridness had manifested itself almost as soon as they had taken their seats on the train from Southampton and with each mile north it had increased, while Mrs. Flores' conviction that she had made a terrible mistake grew into a certainty. Old Flores on land had none of that old-world charm that had so affected her at sea. For being an eccentric and outspoken old man in his dotage, he had relapsed into an eccentric and outspoken old man with more faculties at his command than his age warranted. Porters scurried with their luggage, ticket collectors cringed, and even hardened taxi drivers, notorious for their rudeness when given an inadequate tip, held their tongues, while Mr. Flores disputed the fare and grudgingly gave them an extra penny. Mrs. Flores had been left speechless by his authority, which flaunted a disregard for every tenet of her suburban creed and treated the world as his oyster. 
Since Mrs. Flores had already been treated, almost literally, as his sexual oyster, to be prized open on their honeymoon, she should not have been surprised. It had been bad enough to discover on their first night that Mr. Flores wore a red flannel nightgown with an odour all its own, and that he failed three times to distinguish between the wash basin and the lavatory bowl. Mrs. Flores had put these failings down to his age and deficient eyesight and smell. She had been similarly dismayed when he knelt by the bed and implored the good Lord to forgive him in advance the carnal excesses he was about to inflict upon this, the person of my wedded wife. Little suspecting what he had in mind, Mrs. Flores found his prayer rather complimentary. It confirmed her belief that she was still at fifty-six an attractive woman, and that her husband was a deeply religious man. Ten minutes later, she knew better. Whatever the good Lord might feel about the matter of forgiveness, Mrs. Flores's feelings were implacable. She would never forgive or forget the old man's carnal excesses, and any notion that he was at all religious had gone by the board. Smelling like an old fox, Mr. Flores had behaved like a young one, and had roamed about her body with as little discrimination between points of entry, or as she more delicately put it, her orifices, as he did between the wash basin and the toilet, and with much the same intent. Feeling like a cross between a sexual colander and a cesspit, Mrs. Flores had endured the ordeal by consoling herself that such goings-on must end abruptly in the old man having either a heart attack or a hernia. Mr. Flores obliged her on neither count. When she awoke the next morning, it was to find him sitting up, smoking a foul old pipe, and regarding her with undisguised relish. The rest of the voyage, Mrs. Flores had waddled to the deck by day, straddled to the bed by night, in the dwindling hope that the wages of his sin would leave her shortly a rich and well-endowed widow. So she had travelled north with him, determined to see the ordeal out to the end, not to be deterred by his behaviour. Whatever treasures in the way of old silver and fine furniture Flores Hall might hold, without electricity it held only transitory attractions for Mrs. Flores. No electricity meant presumably no central heating. The single tap above the stone sink had signified only cold water. Mrs. Flores decided that the time had come to strike. She sat down heavily in a large, high-backed leather chair beside a fire and glared at him. The very idea of bringing me here and expecting me to live in a house without electricity or hot water or any mod cons, she began stridently as the old man bent to light a spill from the fire. Mr. Flores turned his face towards her and she saw it was suffused with rage. Woman, he said with a soft, steely emphasis, you'll learn never to address me in that tone of voice again. He straightened up. Mrs. Flores was not to be cowed. And you'll learn never to call me woman again, she said defiantly. And don't think that you can bully me because you can't. It's perfectly simple. We need not argue about it. We can install an electrical generator. You'll find it will make a tremendous improvement to your life. Mr. Flores shook his head. I have lived without it for ninety years and I'll die without it. I shouldn't be at all surprised, said Mrs. Flores. But I see no reason why you should take me with you. I'm used to hot water and my home comforts. I'll have no modern contraption. He wrangled on until it was time for dinner. And in the kitchen, Mr. Dodd listened with an interested ear while he stirred the stewed mutton in the pot. The old devil's button off a sight more than his teeth that is he did chew, he thought to himself, and tossed a bone to his old collie by the door. And if the mither's so rigid, which the lassie like? With this on his mind, he moved about the kitchen, which had seen so many centuries of Flores' womenfolk come and go, and where the smells of those centuries which Lockhart pined for still clung. Mr. Dodd had no nose for them. That musk of unwashed humanity, of old boots and dirty socks, wet dogs and mangy cats, of soap and polish, fresh milk and warm blood, baked bread and hung pheasant. All those necessities of the harsh life the Flawses had led since the house was first built. He was part of that musk and shared its ancestry. But now there was a new ingredient come to the house, and one he had no mind to like. Nor after a glum dinner had Mr. Flaws, when he and Mrs. Flaws retired to a cold bedroom and a feather bed redolent of damp and too recently plucked chicken. Outside the wind whistled in the chimneys, and from the kitchen there came the faint wail of Mr. Dodd's Northumbrian pipes as he played Edward Edward. It seemed an appropriate ballad for the evil hour. Upstairs, Mr. Flores knelt by the bed. Oh, Lord, he began, only to be interrupted by his wife. You're not coming near me until we first come to an understanding. I didn't marry you to catch my death of pneumonia. 
Mr. Flores lumbered to his feet. And I did that to marry you, he thundered, to have my household arrangement stuck it into my, my shit of a woman. I am not a shit of a woman, she snapped back. I happen to be a respectable... Respectable? Oh, yeah. And what sort of respectable woman is it that marries an old man for his money? Money? said Mrs. Flores, alarmed at this fresh evidence that the old fool wasn't such an old fool after all. Who said anything about money? I did! roared Mr. Flaws. You proposed and I disposed, but if you imagined for one moment that I didn't know what you were after, you'd sadly misguided. Well, you have made your bed. Now you must lie on it. Not with you, said Mrs. Flaws. I'd rather die. Mr. Flaws hurled the poker into the grate and went to the door. You'll live to do the day you said that, ma'am, he muttered benevolently and left. Next morning, after a fitful night, Mrs. Flores came downstairs to find the old man closeted in his sanctum. Outside in the yard, the grey products of Mr. Flores's experiments in canine eugenics lolled about in the wintry sunshine. Avoiding them by going out of the kitchen door, Mrs. Flores made her way round the garden. In one corner there was a gazebo, a little belvedere of flint and seashells embedded in cement with a tiny Gothic window paned with coloured glass. Mrs. Flores climbed the steps to the door, found it unlocked, and went inside to discover the first signs of comfort at the hall. Mrs. Flaw seated herself there and wondered again at the strangeness of the family into which she had so unwisely married. She was just trying to think of some way of making her own departure when the tall, gaunt figure of her husband emerged from the kitchen garden and made its way between the rockeries and miniature trees to the gazebo. Mrs. Flaw steeled herself for this encounter. May I come in? he asked. I suppose so said Mrs. Flores. The old man bowed his head. He too had spent a wakeful night wrestling with his conscience and losing hands down. I have come to beg your pardon, he said finally. My conduct as your husband was inexcusable. I trust you will accept my humble apologies. Sir Sandicott hesitated. Her former marriage had not disposed her to forfeit her right to grievance too easily. There were advantages to be gained from it. Among them, power. You accuse me of marrying you for your money. Now that I won't take from anyone. Quite so, ma'am. I married you because you were old and lonely and needed someone to look after you. The thought of money never entered my head. Quite so, said Mr. Flaws, accepting these personally insulting attributes with some difficulty. As you say, I am old and lonely, and I need someone to look after me. Now, I can't be expected to look after anyone with the present lack of amenities in the house. I want electricity and hot baths and television and central heating if I am to stay here. Mr. Flores nodded sadly that it should have come to this. You shall have them, ma'am, he said. You shall have them. Now let us adjourn to my study in the warmth of my fire to discuss the matter of my will. I will be frank with you said Mr. Flaws. My grandson, your son-in-law, Lockhart, is a bastard, the product of an illicit union between my late daughter and person, or persons unknown. And I've made it my life's work to determine, firstly, his paternal ancestry, and secondly, to eradicate those propensities to which, by virtue of his being partly of flaws, I have access. While he stared into the depths of the fire, as into hell itself, Mrs. Flores contented herself with the realization that Lockhart's illegitimacy was one more arrow to the bow of her domestic power. The old fool would suffer for the admission. Mrs. Flores had garnered a fresh grievance. When I think that my Jessica is married to an illegitimate man, I must say I find your behavior inexcusable and dishonorable. I do indeed, she said, taking advantage of Mr. Flores's mood of submission. If I had known, I would never have given consent to the marriage. Mr. Flores nodded humbly. You must forgive me, he said. But needs must when the devil drives, and your daughter's saintliness will dilute the evil of Lockhart's paternal line. I sincerely hope so, said Mrs. Flores. And talking about inheritance, I believe you mentioned remaking your will. And so, from things theoretical, they moved to practicalities. I will send for my solicitor, Mr. Bulstrode, and have him draw up the new will. You will be the beneficiary, ma'am. Mrs. Flores smiled contentedly. You foresaw a comfortable future. And in the meantime, you will see to it that the hall is modernized, she said. And again, Mr. Flores nodded. In that case, I shall stay. 
said Mrs. Flaws, graciously. This time there was the flicker of a smile on Mr. Flaws' face, but it died instantly. There was no point in giving his game away. He would buy time by affecting submission. That night, Mr. Dodd was dispatched with a sealed envelope bearing the Flaws' crest and printed in wax on the back. It contained precise instructions as to the contents of Mr. Flaws' new will, and when Mrs. Flaws came down to breakfast next morning, it was to learn that her husband had lived up to his word. Lockhart no longer spent his days at Sandy Cotton Partner in Wheatle Street. Mr. Trier paid Lockhart his full salary, plus a bonus, to stay away from the office before he brought ruin to the business by killing a tax inspector. Lockhart accepted this arrangement without regret. Left fully paid to his own devices, Lockhart had remained at home and learnt to drive. It will help to kill the time, he told Jessica, and had promptly done his best to kill two driving instructors and a great many other road users. In the end, by paying one of the instructors danger money and allowing him to sit in the back seat with a crash helmet and two safety belts, Lockhart had got the hang of driving. The fact that the instructor had insisted on Lockhart providing his own vehicle had led him to buy a Land Rover. It had been the instructor who installed a governor on the accelerator, and together they had practiced on an abandoned airfield where there were few obstacles and no other cars. Even in these unobstructed circumstances, Lockhart had managed to puncture two hangars in ten places by driving straight through corrugated walls at forty miles an hour, and it was testimony to the Land Rover that it took it so well. Not so the instructor. He had taken it extremely badly, and had only been persuaded to come out again by being offered even more money and half a bottle of scotch before he got into the back seat. After six weeks, Lockhart had overcome his manifest desire to drive at things rather than round them, and had graduated to side roads, and finally to main ones. By that time, the instructor pronounced him ready to take the test. The examiner thought otherwise, and demanded to be let out of the car halfway through. But on his third attempt, Lockhart got his license largely because the examiner couldn't face the prospect of having to sit beside him a fourth time. Mr. Flaws's letter summoning the couple to Flaws Hall to hear the contents of his will therefore came at an opportune moment. Oh, darling, said Jessica, I've been dying to see your home. How marvellous. It rather sounds as if Grandfather were dying anyway, said Lockhart, studying the letter. Why does he want to read his will now? He probably just wants you to know how generous he's going to be, said Jessica, who always managed to put a nice interpretation on the nastiest actions. Lockhart didn't. You don't know Grandpa, he said. When they breasted the rise of Tombstone Law and looked across the valley of the hall, it was ablaze with lights in every window. Oh, how beautiful, said Jessica. Let's stop here for a moment. I want to savour it so. She got out and gazed ecstatically at the house. From its peel tower to its smoking chimneys and the lights gleaming from its windows, it was everything she had hoped for. And it was in the bellicose setting of the Peel Tower that Mr. Flaws chose to have his will read. You are gathered here today, Mr. Bulstrode announced, to hear the last will and testament of Edwin Tyndale Flaws. I, Edwin of Tyndale Flaws, being of sound mind and feeble yet sufficient body to sustain my mind, do hereby leave, bequeath, and devise all my worldly goods, chattels, property, and land to my wife, Mrs. Cynthia Flaws, for to have and to hold in trust and in use until her own death, the bees, departure from this place, which place being defined more closely, is the radius of one mile from Flaws Hall, and on condition that she do not sell mortgage, rent, borrow, pledge, or pawn, a single or multiple of the possessions so bequeathed, left, and devised, and in no way improves, alters, adds, or amends the amenities of the said property, possession, chattels, and house, but subsists upon the income alone in recognition of which undertaking she signs herewith, this will, as being a binding contract. Will you so sign? Alstrode asked. But Mrs. Floss was in a flux of emotions. Coming so shortly after being compared to a vulture, this act of generosity had thrown her calculating compass off course. She needed time to think. It was denied to her. Sign, ma'am, said Mr. Floss, or the will becomes null and void insofar as it appertains to you. Mrs. Floss took the pen and signed. I tell you, Mr. Bulstrode, said the old man, almost gaily. And Mr. Bulstrode took up the will again. To my grandson Lockhart Flaws, I'll leave nothing except my name, until and unless he shall have produced in physical form the person of his natural father, which father shall be proved to the satisfaction of my executor, Mr. Bulstrode, to be the admitted and undoubted father of the said Lockhart, 
that shall have signed an affidavit to that effect, which affidavit having been signed, it shall be flogged by the said Lockhart to within an inch of his life. In the event of these aforestated conditions, the will in respect of my wife, Cynthia Flaws, shall and will become automatically null and void. And the estate, property, chattels, land and possessions pass in toto to my grandson, Lockhart Flaws. There was a sudden scream from Mrs. Flaws. You've cheated me. You said you would leave everything to me, and now you've added a clause saying that I forfeit all right to inherit if... if that illegitimate creature finds his father. Mr. Flaws ignored her outburst and signed the will. She had been hoodwinked. There's nothing to say that I have to stay here while you're still alive. I shall leave first thing tomorrow. Mr. Flaws laughed. Ma'am, <laughs> he said, you have signed a contract to remain here for the rest of your life or address me for the loss of your presence to the tune of five thousand pounds a year. Mr. Bulstrode handed her the will. You will find the clause on page one, he said. Mrs. Flaws gaped at him incredulously and then followed his finger down the page. But you didn't read that out, she said as the words swam before her eye. Oh, my God! And she sank back into her chair. Upstairs in the solitude of her bedroom, Mrs. Flaws was beside herself. Mrs. Flaws considered her revenge. It lay, she realized, in Lockhart. Deny Lockhart the means to search for his father, and here Mrs. Flaws' thoughts flew to money, and she would be secure. She would see that Lockhart had no means. Reaching for her writing case, she put pen to paper and wrote a short, concise letter to Mr. Trier, instructing him to dismiss Lockhart from Sandy Cotton Partner without notice. Mrs. Flaws then went on to consider other ways of taking her revenge. By the time the afternoon had waned, she was in a more cheerful mood. The old man had stipulated in his will that there should be no improvements to the hall. She intended to stick to the letter of his instructions. There would be no improvements, and for the rest of his unnatural life there would be the reverse. Windows would be opened, doors unlatched, food cold and damp, beds damper still, until with her assistance the infirmities of age had been accelerated to his end. Yes, that was it. Delay Lockhart at all cost, and hasten her husband's dying. In the meantime, she would put a fine face on things. If Mrs. Flaws had been disturbed by the reading of the will, so had Lockhart. I didn't know it meant I had no father. He told her, I thought it was just another word he used for me. He's always calling people bastards. But don't you see how exciting it all is? Said Jessica. It's like a paper chase or hunt the father. And when you find him, you'll inherit the whole estate and we can come and live up here. It's not going to be easy to find a father who's got to be flogged within an inch of his life the moment he admits it. Said Lockhart practically. Two days later, Lockhart presented himself for the last time at Sandicott and Partner and handed Mr. Trier the envelope containing Mrs. Flaws's instructions. Half an hour later, he left again, while behind him Mr. Trier praised whatever gods there be. Lockhart left the office and returned home to Jessica. But why should Mummy have done such a horrid thing, she asked. What are you going to do now? Get another job, I suppose, said Lockhart. But the supposition came easier than the result. The labour exchange was already swamped with applications from ex-stockbrokers, and Mr. Trier's refusal to grant that he had ever been employed at Sandicott, combined with his lack of any means of identification, made Lockhart's position hopeless. It was the same at the Social Security office. By the time Lockhart got home, he was utterly despondent. Oh dear, said Jessica, if only we could sell all the houses Daddy left me, we could invest the money and live off the income. Why can't we just tell the tenants to go? Because the law says they don't have to move. Who cares what the law says, said Jessica. There's a law which says unemployed people get free money, but when it comes to paying you, they don't do it. I can see why we have to obey a law which hurts us when the government won't obey a law which helps us. What's good for the goose is good for the gander, Lockhart agreed. And so was born the idea which nurtured in Lockhart Flaws' mind was to turn the quiet backwater of Sandicott Crescent into a maelstrom of misunderstanding. End of side one. That night, while Jessica racked her brains for some way to supplement their income, Lockhart left the house and stole through the gorse bushes in the bird sanctuary with a pair of binoculars. He was not bird-watching in its true sense, 
By the time he returned at midnight, the occupants of most of the houses had been observed, and Lockhart had gained some little insight into their habits. He sat up for a while, making notes in a pocket book. It was carefully indexed, and under P he put Pettigrew, man and wife age fifty. Put Dachshund named Little Woolly out at eleven and make a milk drink. Go to bed eleven thirty. Under R he noted that Mr. and Mrs. Racim in number eight did something strange which involved tying Mr. Racim to the bed. At number four the Mrs. Musgrove had entertained the vicar. Finally, next door to the floor's house, Colonel Finch Potter in number ten smoked a cigar after a solitary dinner and then took a brisk walk with his bull terrier before retiring. Lockhart made notes of all these practices and went to bed himself. Something deep and devious was stirring in his mind. What it was, he couldn't exactly say, but the instinct of the hunt was slowly edging its way towards consciousness, and with it, a barbarity and anger that knew nothing of the law or the social conventions. Next morning, Jessica announced that she was going to get a job. I can type and take shorthand, but there's lots of firms wanting secretaries. I'm going to a bureau. They're advertising for temporary typists. I don't like it, said Lockhart. A man should provide for his wife, not the other way round. If anyone tries anything funny, Lockhart remembered Mr. Trier's tendencies with temporary typists. I wish to tell me. I'll kill him. Oh, Lockhart, darling, you're so chivalrous, said Jessica proudly. Let's have a kiss and a cuddle tonight. But Lockhart had other plans for the evening, and Jessica went to bed alone. Outside, Lockhart crawled through the undergrowth of the bird sanctuary to the foot of the Racemes garden, climbed the fence, and installed himself in a cherry tree that overlooked the Racemes bedroom. He had decided that Mr. Racemes' peculiar habit of allowing his wife to tie him to their double bed for three quarters of an hour might provide him with information for future use. But he was disappointed. Mr. and Mrs. Racemes had supper and watched television before having an early and less restrained night. At eleven, their lights went out. Lockhart descended the cherry tree and was making his way back over the fence when the Pettigrews at number six put Little Willie out while they made Ovaltine. Attracted by Lockhart's passage through the gorse, the Dachshund dashed down the garden with a series of yelps and stood barking into the darkness. Lockhart moved away, but the dog kept up its hullabaloo and presently Mr. Pettigrew came down the lawn to investigate. Now, Willie, stop that noise, he said. Good dog, there's nothing there. But Willie knew better and emboldened by his master's presence, made further rushes in Lockhart's direction. Finally, Mr. Pettigrew picked the dog up and carried him back into the house, leaving Lockhart with the resolution to do something about Willie as soon as possible. Barking dogs were a hazard he could do without. He progressed by way of the Mrs. Musgrove's back garden, their lights had gone out promptly at ten, and crossed into the gravels, where the downstairs lights were on and the living room curtains partly open. Lockhart stationed himself beside the Gravel's greenhouse and focused his binoculars on the gap in the curtains and was surprised to see Mrs. Gravel on the sofa in the arms of someone who was quite clearly not Mr. Gravel. As the couple writhed in ecstasy, Lockhart's binoculars discovered the flushed face of Mr. Simplon, who lived at number five. Mrs. Gravel and Mr. Simplon. Then where was Mr. Gravel and what was Mrs. Simplon doing? An hour later, Mr. Simplon garaged his car. Lights went on in the house, and a moment later voices issued from the bedroom. Working late at the office, my foot, said Mrs. Simplon. I was out with Jerry Blond, the architect, said Mr. Simplon. If you don't believe me, phone Blond and see if he doesn't confirm what I say. But Mrs. Simplon scorned the idea. I'm not going to advertise the fact that I have my own ideas about what you get up to, she said. I've got more pride. If she wasn't going to advertise what she correctly thought Mr. Simplon was getting up to, namely Mrs. Gravel, it might be to Lockhart's own advantage to do it for her. Meanwhile, Lockhart decided to study the Wilsons at number 11. Here the lights were on, though dimly, in the downstairs lounge and the French windows open. There were three people in the room sitting round a small table with their fingers touching. And as he watched, the table moved. Every now and again, Mrs. Wilson would put a question and the table would rock and knock. So the Wilsons were superstitious. And so for the next fortnight, Lockhart amassed dossiers on the habits, fads, foibles and indiscretions of all the tenants of the Crescent. It was three days before the Wilsons went out for the evening, and Lockhart was able to slip over the fence into their garden and let himself into number 11. Under his arm, he carried a box labeled DIY Radio Construction. He spent hours in the attic before returning empty-handed. Then he stationed himself at the front window and waited for the Wilsons to return. They had had a good evening and were in an intensely spiritual state. Lockhart watched the lights come on in their bedroom and bathroom, 
before contributing his share to their belief in the supernatural. Holding his nose between finger and thumb and speaking adenoidally into the microphone, he whispered, I speak from beyond the grave. Hear me. There will be a death in your house, and you will join me. And he switched the transmitter off and went out into the night, the better to observe the result. It was, to put it mildly, electrifying. There's no use saying you didn't, wailed Mrs. Wilson. You heard it as clearly as I did, and you were in the bathroom, and look at the mess you made on the floor. Mr. Wilson had to agree that his aim had been put off. I told you we should never have started fooling with that damned table wrapping, he shouted. Now look what you've been and let loose. That's right. Blame me, screamed Mrs. Wilson. And don't hog all the brandy. I want some. Lockhart left them consoling themselves somewhat unsuccessfully, but at least the terrible prophecy proved that there was life after death. It didn't seem to comfort Mrs. Wilson very much. At precisely eleven o'clock, Mr. Pettigrew put Little Willie out, and just as precisely, Lockhart, lurking in the bird sanctuary, tugged on the nylon fishing line that stretched under the fence and down the lawn. At the end of the line, a lump of liver purchased that morning from the butcher pursued its erratic course across the grass. Behind it came Willie, in hot pursuit. He didn't come far. As the liver slid past the snare Lockhart had set at the end of the lawn, Willie stopped, and after a brief struggle, gave up both the pursuit and his life. Lockhart buried him under a rose bush at the bottom of his own garden, where he would do most good, and having accomplished his first two intentions, went to bed in a thoroughly cheerful mood. While Lockhart began to make life uncomfortable for the tenants in his wife's houses, her mother was doing her damnedest to make life unbearable for Mr. Flaws. The weather was not on her side. From a bright spring they passed into a hot summer, and Flaws Hall showed itself to advantage. Its thick walls had more functions than the keeping out of the Scots and the keeping in of the whisky. They soothed the summer's heat. Outside, the hybrid hounds might slobber and loll in the dung-dry dust of the yard. Inside, Mr. Flores could sit contentedly upright at his desk, poring over the parish registers. But there was more to old Mr. Flores's ancestral interest than mere curiosity concerning his own relations. There was still the great question mark that haunted his nights as to the paternity of Lockhart. Behind it lay the horrifying feeling that Lockhart was as much his son as his grandson. It was with this in mind that he added the flagellant clause to the will, in part recognition that if his suspicions were true, he deserved to be flogged within an inch of his life, and more properly, a yard beyond. Mrs. Flores had, as part of their plan for his early death, decided to play the role of dutiful wife. Far from repulsing his advances, she positively encouraged him to strain his heart by sleeping with her. Mr. Flores' prostate redressed the balance and prevented him from rising to these frequent occasions. Mrs. Flores took to bringing him his early morning cup of tea in bed, having first laced it with powdered paracetamol tablets, which she had read affected the kidneys adversely. Mr. Flores didn't drink tea in bed, but not to hurt her feelings, empties his cup into the chamber pot, with the result that Mrs. Flores' hopes were aroused quite fortuitously by the colour of the contents when she emptied it later in the day. The fact that the potion contained tea leaves that she was too fastidious to examine it closely, led her to the vain hope that there was something seriously amiss with his bladder. Finally, she put him on an even higher cholesterol diet than usual. Mr. Flores had eggs for breakfast, fried eggs with lamb chops for lunch, pork for dinner, and zabaglione for dessert, and an eggnog before retiring. Mr. Flores thrived on eggs. Mrs. Flores added sugar to her list of dietetic poisons, and having pressed Mr. Flores to another egg or some more pork crackling, served sweets, cakes, and biscuits that consisted almost entirely of sugar. Mr. Flores' energy increased enormously. Mrs. Flores watched his progress in despair, and her own increased weight with alarm. All very well trying to poison the old man by overindulgence, but she had to share the same diet, and it didn't agree with her. Finally, in a last desperate effort, she encouraged him to hit the port bottle. Mr. Flores followed her advice cheerfully and felt all the better for it. Mrs. Flores fortified the port decanter with brandy, and Mr. Flores, whose nose for a fine wine was acute, recognized the addition and congratulated her on her ingenuity. There's that more body, he declared. I wonder I hadn't thought of it before. Definitely more body. Mrs. Flores silently cursed, but had to agree. Port with more than its normal quota of brandy did have more body. On the other hand, so did she and her dresses were beginning to look as though they belonged to another woman.
Mr. Flaws found her greater girth a source of amusement, and made uncalled-for remarks to Mr. Dodd about breasts, bottoms, and bitches being all the better for bed when broad. All the while, Mrs. Flaws was conscious that Mr. Dodd kept his uncast eye upon her. She found it unnerving, and Mr. Dodd's collie had a nasty habit of snarling whenever she passed too close. I wish you'd keep the creature out of the kitchen, she told Mr. Dodd irritably. Aye, uh, and me with her, I dare say, said Mr. Dodd. You'd be hard put to it to keep yourself warm without my going down the drift mine for coal. If you don't want me in the kitchen, you'll have to go and dig it yourself. Mrs. Flaws had no intention of going down the drift mine to dig coal, and said so. Then the dog stays, said Mr. Dodd. Mrs. Flaws promised herself to see that the collie didn't. But Mr. Dodd's habit of feeding the beast himself prevented her from putting ground glass in the dog's food. All in all, it was a trying summer for Mrs. Flaws, and she found herself uncharacteristically yearning for the bleak winter ahead. She would have more opportunity for making things uncomfortable at the hall. Lockhart had already succeeded at Sandicott Crescent, having dispatched little Willie, the Pettigrew's Daxon, to that afterlife about which the Wilsons now had no doubts. He was able to move more easily about the gardens on his solitary expeditions. Mr. Grabble, whose wife he had seen in Mr. Simplon's arms, was the European manager for a firm of electronics engineers and regularly went abroad. It was during his absences that Mrs. Grabble and Mr. Simplon kept what Lockhart called their trysts. Further investigation revealed that Mr. Grabble had left an emergency number in Amsterdam where he could always be reached should need arise. Accordingly, on a hot afternoon in June, Lockhart went to the trouble of sending a telegram to Mr. Grabble in Amsterdam, recommending him to return home at once as his wife was dangerously ill, too ill, in fact, to be moved from the house. Having signed it in the name of a fictitious doctor, Lockhart quietly shinned a telegraph pole in the bird sanctuary and neatly severed the line to the Grabble's house. After that, he went home and had tea before going out as dusk fell and making his way to the corner of the road in which Mr. Simplon left his car. The car was there. It was not there twenty-five minutes later, when Mr. Gravel, driving with more reckless concern for his wife than her behaviour justified, and less for other road users, hurtled through East Pursley and into Sandicott Crescent. It was not there when Mr. Simplon, naked and covering his previously private parts with both hands, scampered down the Gravel's drive and shot frenziedly round the corner. It was sitting in the Simplon's garage, where Lockhart had parked with a cheerful toot of the horn to alert Mrs. Simplon that her husband was home before crossing to the golf course and making his way sedately back to Jessica at number 12. The discovery that his wife, far from being dangerously ill, was copulating ardently with a neighbour he had never much liked anyway, and that he had been brought anxiously all the way back from Amsterdam to have this ugly fact thrust under his unsuspecting nose, was too much for Mr. Grabble's temper. His shouts and Mrs. Grabble's screams were audible to Mrs. Simplon. The fact that her husband, having just driven into the garage, figured so largely in Mr. Grabble's invective, provoked her to investigate how he could possibly be in two places at the same time. Mr. Grabble's commentary supplied a third occupation, that of Mrs. Grabble. Mrs. Simplon emerged from the front door at the very same moment as a naked Mr. Simplon was scampering back to his own house. As he stood under the mock Georgian portico of his front door and beat on the cupid head knocker with one hand while pressing the bell with his elbow at the same time, Mr. Simplon knew that his reputation as a consultant engineer was at an end. So was Mrs. Simplon's tolerance. Her husband's constant absences and lame excuses had combined with her own sexual frustration to leave her a bitter woman. You can stay out there till hell freezes over, she shouted at her nearest. But if you think I'm letting you into my home ever again, you've got another thing coming. Mrs. Simplon added an extra sting to the statement by squirting the contents of an aerosol can of de-icing fluid through the letterbox onto those shriveled organs Mrs. Gravel had recently found so attractive. The screams that followed this remarkable initiative were music to her ears. It was certainly music to Lockhart, who had last heard their like at a pig killing without use of humane killer. He sat in the kitchen with Jessica and smiled over his Ovaltine. I wonder what could be going on, said Jessica anxiously. It sounds as if someone's dying. Hadn't you better go and investigate? I mean, perhaps you could do something. Lockhart shook his head. Strong fences make good neighbours he said complacently, a maxim that was in some dispute at the far end of the crescent. There Mr. Simplon's screams and Mr. Gravel's denunciations and Mrs. Gravel's absurd denials had been joined by the siren of a police car. The Pettigrews, already in communication with the police following the loss of Little Willie, had phoned again.
This time the police took their complaint more seriously and had taken Mr Simplon into custody for indecent exposure. A charge Mr Simplon, who had been playing the garden sprinkler rather erratically on his inflamed penis when they arrived, was incapable of finding words to deny. With his going, Sandicott Crescent resumed its interrupted routine. Lockhart went into his garage and promised the Wilsons next door an imminent death to such effect that their lights remained on all night. All in all, he thought, as he climbed into bed beside his radiant angel, Jessica. It had been a most rewarding and informative day, and if he could keep the impetus of his campaign up, the for-sale boards would shortly be in evidence in Sandicott Crescent. It was Jessica, returning from her work as a temporary typist next day, who brought a further development. You'll never guess who lives in Green End, she said excitedly. Genevieve Goldring. Never heard of it said Lockhart, swishing the air with a riding crop he had constructed out of a length of garden hose, thonged at the end with leather strips. You must have, said Jessica. She's just the most wonderful writer there ever was. And you know what? Patsy's going to let me go and work over there in her place tomorrow. I'm so excited. I can't wait. Nor could Mr. Simplon. His appearance in court had been brief, and he had been released on bail to await trial. Mr. Simplon returned home, and his subsequent action of breaking a back window in his own house had been met by the contents of a bottle of ammonia and a further visit to the police station on a charge of making a public nuisance of himself. Next door, the Mrs. Musgrove shook their heads sadly and spoke softly of the wickedness of the modern world, while speculating separately on the size, shape, and subsequent colour change of Mr. Simplon's genitalia. It was the first glimpse they had ever had of a naked man, and having glimpsed their appetite though too late in life to lead them to hope it would be satisfied, was whetted. They need not have been so pessimistic. It was soon to be sated. Lockhart, intrigued by what he had seen in the Raceman's bedroom, had decided to acquaint himself more fully with the sexual peccadilloes of the human race. And while Jessica went joyfully off next day to her rendezvous with literary fame in Miss Genevieve Goldring's garden hut, Lockhart took the train to London, spent several hours in Soho, leafing through magazines, and returned with a catalogue from a sex shop. Lockhart began to understand more fully the nature of sex and to recognise his own ignorance. The Wilsons next door were a more immediate target for his campaign of eviction, and it had occurred to him that something more than the sound of a voice from beyond the grave might add urgency to their departure. He decided to include smell, and taking a spade, he dug up the putrefying body of little Willie, dismembered it in the garage, and distributed its portions in the Wilsons' coal cellar, while they were out, drowning their memories of the previous night at the local pub. Jessica's experience of acting as amanuensis to the literary heroine of her youth, Miss Genevieve Goldring, had filled her with a terrible sense of disillusionment. She's just the most horrible person you ever met, she said, almost sobbing. She's cynical and nasty, and all she thinks about is money. She just walks up and down dictating what she calls the verbal shit my public likes to lick its chops over. And she's not even called Genevieve Goldring. She's Miss Magster, and she drinks creme de menthe. And then the golf ball went wrong, and she blamed me. Golf ball? said Lockhart. What the hell was she doing with a golf ball? It's a typewriter, a, a, a golf ball typewriter, Jessica explained. Instead of having separate letters on bars that hit the paper, it has this golf ball with the alphabet on it that goes round and runs along the paper, printing the letters. You can take the golf ball with the alphabet on it off and put another one on when you want a different typeface. You can? That's interesting. So if you took the golf ball off her typewriter and brought it home, you could put it on your own typewriter and it would look exactly the same. The stuff you wrote, I mean... Well, you couldn't do it with an ordinary typewriter, said Jessica, but if you had the same sort as hers, nobody could tell the difference. Anyway, she was just beastly, and I hate her. Darling, said Lockhart, you remember when you were working for those solicitors, gibbling and gibbling, and you told me about writing nasty things in books about people and libel and all that? Yes, said Jessica. I just wish that horrid woman would write something nasty about us. The gleam in Lockhart's eyes stopped her. Oh, Lockhart, she said, you are clever. As darkness fell over the golf course and east and west Pursley, Lockhart made his way to Green End and the shed at the bottom of the great authoress's garden. He returned with the first three chapters of her latest novel, Song of the Heart, plus the golf ball from her typewriter. And late into the night, Jessica sat and retyped the chapters. The heroine, previously called Sally, was now called Jessica, and the hero, such as he was, was transformed from David to Lockhart. Finally, the name Flaws figured largely in the revised version 
But at three in the morning, Lockhart placed in the drawer in the shed. There were other changes, too, and none of them to the advantage of Miss Goldring's characters. Lockhart flaws in the new version liked being tied to the bed and whipped by Jessica, and when not being whipped, stole money from banks. All told, Song of the Heart had ingredients added that were extraordinarily libelous. It was only when the novel was finished a fortnight later that Lockhart could relax and put Phase 2 into operation. First he made further use of Jessica's typewriter by purchasing a fresh golf ball with a different typeface and composing a letter to the manufacturers of those artifacts of sexual stimulation that had intrigued and disgusted him in the catalogue. In his letter, Miss Musgrove ordered an ejaculatory and vibrating dildo of adjustable proportions, the bottom half of a plastic man complete with organs, and finally a studded rubber pad with battery attached which called itself a clitoral stimulator. Not to spoil the ship for a hapeth of tar, Lockhart also subscribed to Lesbian Lusts, Women Only, and Pussy Kiss, which three magazines he had been so appalled by that their effect on the Mrs. Musgrove month after month would be devastating. But having sent the letter, he had to wait for the postal delay before observing any result. In the case of the Racemes, results were more immediate. He had noticed that Mrs. Raceem was friendly with a Mrs. Artu, who lived in a flat in the centre of East Pursley. And so on Wednesday night, Lockhart waited in the bird sanctuary with a stopwatch and gave Mrs. Raceem ten minutes in which to attach her husband to the bed with the leather straps they seemed to favour before going to the phone box on the corner and dialing the Raceem number. Mrs. Raceem took the call. Come, come at once, Lockhart said through a handkerchief. Mrs. Arto has had a stroke and is asking for you. He emerged from the phone box in time to see the Racim Saab shoot out of the drive. Lockhart sauntered down the street to their house, unlocked the door, and went quietly inside. He turned out the light in the hall and peered into the bedroom. Naked, hooded, and bound, Mr. Racim was in the grip of those obscure masochistic emotions which gave him so much peculiar satisfaction. He squirmed ecstatically on the bed. A second later he was still squirming, but the ecstasy had gone. Used to the exquisite pain of Mrs. Racim's light birch, the application of Lockhart's patent horsewhip at maximum velocity to his rump produced a reflex that threatened to lift both his body off the bed and the bed off the floor. Mr. Racim spat the gag out of his mouth and tried to express his feelings vocally. Lockhart suppressed his yell by pushing his head onto the pillow and applied his horsewhip to full advantage. By the time he had finished, Mr. Racim had passed from masochism to sadism. I'll murder you, you bitch! He screamed as Lockhart shut the bedroom door. So help me God, I'll kill you if it's the last thing I do! Lockhart let himself out of the front door and went round to the garden. From inside the house, Mr. Racim's screams and threats had begun to alternate with whimpers. Lockhart installed himself in the bushes and waited for Mrs. Racim to return. If half of the threats her husband was making were carried out, he might well have to intervene once again to save her life. He debated the point but decided that whatever Mr. Racine might say, the state of his backside would deter him from putting anything into practice. He was on the point of leaving when the Saab's headlights shone in the drive, and Mrs. Racine let herself into the house. What do you mean I did this to you? She shrieked as the double bed wedded to Mr. Racine's feet blundered towards her. I got this phone call from someone saying Mrs. Arthur had had a stroke. The word was too much for Mr. Racine. Stroke? He yelled in a muffled sort of way through the pillow and the mattress that obstructed his view of things. What in the name of hell did you mean by stroke? In the garden, Lockhart knew precisely. Well, all I'm telling you, shrieked Mrs. Racy, was that if you think I did that to you, you're out of your mind. Mr. Racy was. Impeded by the bed and driven insane by the pain, he hurtled across the room in the general direction of her voice, smashed through the dressing table behind which Mrs. Racy was sheltering and carrying all before him, including Mrs. Racy, shot through the patio window. There his screams were combined with those of Mrs. Racine herself, lacerated in much the same part of her anatomy by the double glazing and a rose bed. Lockhart hesitated and crossed into the bird sanctuary, and as he moved silently towards number twelve, the sound of sirens could be heard above the shouts and yells of the Racines. The Pettigrews had exercised their social conscience once again and phoned for the police. What on earth was all that noise? Jessica inquired as he came in from the garage where he had deposited his horsewhip. It sounded as if someone had fallen through a greenhouse roof. Most peculiar tenants we've got, said Lockhart. It seems to kick up such a rumpus.
Certainly Mr. and Mrs. Racim were kicking up a rumpus, and the police found their predicament most peculiar. Mr. Racim's lacerated posterior and his hood made instant identification difficult, but it was the fact that he was still tied to the bed that intrigued them. Tell me, sir, said the sergeant, who arrived, and promptly phoned for an ambulance. Do you make a habit of wearing hoods when you go to bed? Mind your own bloody business, said Mr. Racim, inadvisedly. I don't ask what you do in the privacy of your home, and you've got no right to ask me. Well, sir, if that's the line you're going to take, we'll take the line that you've used obscene language to a police officer in the execution of his duty and have issued menace against the person of your wife. But what about my person? yelled Mr. Racim. You seem to have overlooked the fact that she thrashed me. We haven't overlooked it, sir, said the sergeant. The lady seems to have made a good job of it. The arrival of a constable, who had been investigating the contents of the Racim's bedroom, and was now carrying a bundle of rods, whips, canes, and cat and nine tails merely confirmed the police in the suspicion that Mr. Racim had got what he asked for. Their sympathy was all for his wife, and when Mr. Racim tried to renew his assault on her, they dispensed with the need for handcuffs and carried him, bed and all, into the Black Maria. Mrs. Racim went away in an ambulance. The sergeant, following in a police car, was frankly puzzled. Something bloody odd going on down there he said to the driver. We better keep an eye on Sandy Cock Crescent from now on. Two days later, Lockhart purchased a wetsuit for underwater diving and an oxygen mask and lifted the cover of the main sewer opposite his house, descended the ladder and closed it behind him. In the darkness, he switched on his torch and made his way along, noting the inlets from each house as he went. It was a large main sewer and offered him fresh insight into the habits of his neighbours. Opposite Colonel Finch Potter's subsidiary were deposited a number of white latex objects which didn't accord with his supposedly bachelor status, while Mr. O'Brien's meanness was proven by his use of a telephone directory for toilet paper. Lockhart returned from his potholing, determined to concentrate his attention on these bachelors. There was the problem of the Colonel's bull terrier to be considered. It was an amiable beast, but of as ferocious an aspect as that of its owner, Mr. O'Brien presented less of a problem. Being Irish, he was a relatively easy target, and when Lockhart had divested himself of his wetsuit and had washed it, he resorted to the telephone yet again. This is the personally brigade of the professional A.R.A., he said in a supposedly Irish voice. We'll be expecting your contribution in the next few days. Mr. O'Brien's reply went unheard. The following morning, Lockhart was up early and on his way to the shopping centre when the mail van arrived and delivered several packets to the Mrs. Musgrove. There must be some mistake, said Miss Mary, examining the address. I didn't order these frightful things. Her elder sister, Maud, looked at her sceptically. I didn't anyway. I can assure you of that, she said icily. They threw the blame on one another for the next hour, but finally curiosity prevailed. It says here said Maud, reading the instructions for the ejaculatory and vibrating dildo of adjustable proportions, that the testicles can be filled with the white of egg and double cream in equal proportions to attain the effect of a lifelike ejaculation. Which do you think the testicles are? Miss Mary correctly discovered them, and presently the two spinsters were busy mixing the necessary ingredients, using the vibrating dildo to best advantage as an egg beater. Having satisfied themselves that the texture was that recommended in the instructions, they had just filled the testicles to capacity when the doorbell rang. I'll answer it, said Mary, and went to the front door. Mrs. Truster, the vicar's wife, was there. Sweeping in her accustomed way down the passage and into the kitchen, Mrs. Truster was horrified at the spectacle that greeted her. Maud Musgrove was holding an enormous and anatomically exact penis in one hand and what appeared to be an icing syringe in the other. Mrs. Truster stared wildly at the thing. To discover with absolute certainty that the Mrs. Musgrove of all people were lesbians who mixed slight culinary gifts with gigantic sexual ones was too much for her poor mind. The room swam for a moment, and she collapsed into a convenient chair. Dear God, oh Lord, she whimpered, and opened her eyes. The beastly thing was still there, and from its, whatever you call it, a dildo opening, there dribbled, Jesus, she said calling on the Almighty, before reverting to more appropriate speech. What in hell's name is going on? It was a question that alerted the Mrs. Musgrove to their socially catastrophic predicament. We were just... They began in unison, when the dildo answered for them. Triggered by Miss Maud's sitting on the mechanism that controlled its functions, the dildo expanded, vibrated, jerked up and down, and fulfilled the guarantee of its manufacturer to the letter. 
Mrs. Truster stared at the terrible thing as it gyrated and expanded, and the mock veins stood out on its trunk. Stop it! For hell's sake, stop the fucking thing! she yelled, forgetting her own social position and the enormity of her horror. Miss Maud did her best. She grappled with the creature and tried desperately to stop it jerking. She succeeded all too well. The dildo lived up to its promise and shot half a pint of mixed egg white and double cream across the kitchen like some formidable fire extinguisher. Having achieved this remarkable feat, it proceeded to go limp. So did Mrs. Truster. She slid off her chair onto the floor and mingled with the dildo's recent contents. Oh, dear, what do we do now? asked Miss Mary. You don't think she's had a heart attack, do you? She knelt beside Mrs. Truster and felt her pulse. It was extremely weak. She's dying, Miss Mary moaned. We've killed her! Nonsense, said Miss Maud practically, and put the deflated dildo on the draining board. But when she knelt beside Mrs. Truster, she had to admit that her pulse was dangerously weak. We'll just have to give her the kiss of life, she said, and together they lifted the vicar's wife onto the kitchen table. How? said Mary. Like this said Maud, who had attended a first aid course, and applied her knowledge and her mouth to the resuscitation of Mrs. Truster. It was immediately successful. From her swoon, Mrs. Truster regained consciousness to find Miss Maud Musgrove kissing her passionately, an activity that was entirely in sexual keeping with what she had already observed of the two spinsters' unnatural lusts. Her eyes bulging in her head and her breath reinforced by that of Miss Maud, Mrs. Truster broke away and screamed at the very top of her voice. And once again, Sandicott Crescent resounded to the shrieks of an hysterical woman. This time there was no need for the Pettigrews to phone the police. The patrol car was at the front door almost immediately, and breaking the glass panel in the window beside it, the police unlocked the door and swarmed down the passage into the kitchen. Mrs. Truster was still shrieking and crouching in the far corner, and on the draining board beside her, motivated a second time by Miss Maud slumping into the chair on which its mechanism stood, slowly swelling and oozing, was the dreadful dildo. Don't let them come anywhere near me with that thing, screamed Mrs. Truster. They tried to, oh God, and she was kissing me, and... If you wouldn't mind just stepping this way, said the sergeant, the Mrs. Musgrove in the kitchen, but can't we put that... The constable will take that and any other evidence he finds into possession, said the sergeant. Just put your coats on and come quietly. A policewoman will come for your night clothes, etc. And following in the footsteps of Mr. Simplon and Mr. and Mrs. Raceem, the Mrs. Musgrove were taken to the police car and driven off at high speed to be charged. That afternoon, on Lockhart's suggestion, Jessica went round to the Wilsons to ask if there was anything she could do as their landlady to rectify the state of their drains. There's a very nasty smell, she said to the wild-eyed Mrs. Wilson. It's really most offensive. Smell? Drains? said Mrs. Wilson, who hadn't considered this practical reason for the stench of death in the house. I'll ask my husband to come over, Jessica said, and see if it isn't the drains. He's very practical. Lockhart arrived ten minutes later with two hundred yards of plastic piping and proceeded to investigate the drainage system with a thoroughness that was entirely reassuring. His conversation wasn't. Lapsing into his broadest Northumbrian as he worked, he spoke of ghosties and ghouls and things that went bump in the night. Ah, how the gaff! To a second sight, he told a gibbering Mrs. Wilson, to as give her me as my birthright. This death I smell and not the drain. I not one death, but in the twain. This murder first, then suicide. Murder first, then suicide, said Mrs. Wilson, in the grip of a terrible curiosity. Lockhart glanced significantly at a carving knife hanging from a magnetic board. A woman screams without a tongue, and then from rafter man is hung. Ye both men leave, er both be dead. The hoose it is that has the curse. I smell your death, and so much worse. His eyes lost their glazed look, and he busied himself about the drains. Upstairs, Mrs. Wilson was packing frantically, and when Mr. Wilson returned, she had already left. Mr. Wilson cursed his wife and went up to have a bath, only to find a rope with a noose on it, hanging from the rafter in the mock Tudor ceiling in the bedroom. As Mr. Wilson stood sickened by the bed, the voice he had heard before spoke again, and this time closer and more convincingly. Hugged by your deck till ye be dead, the grave to date shall be your bed. It bloody well won't, quavered Mr. Wilson, and he too packed and left the house, stopping briefly at number 12 to hand Jessica the key and his notice. We're going and we're never coming back, he said. That bloody house is haunted. <laughs>
That night, Lockhart crossed to the Wilsons' house and began work again. His work involved the hose pipe, the drains, and the waste system. And when he slipped down the manhole entrance to the sewer in his wetsuit, with a large lump of putty in one hand and his torch in the other, there was murder in Lockhart's heart. Mr. O'Brien was about to rue the day he ignored the threat of the Pursley Brigade of the IRA. Working swiftly, Lockhart fed the pipe up the lavatory outlet and then cemented it in place with the putty. Then he crawled back, emerged from the manhole, replaced the cover, and entered the Wilson's empty house. There he switched on the gas main, to which he had connected the pipe, and waited. When Mr. O'Brien awoke in the morning and went downstairs, the smell of gas was overpowering. Mr. O'Brien groped for the telephone, and less wisely for a cigarette, and dialing emergency services, struck a match. The resulting explosion dwarfed all Sandicate Crescent's previous catastrophes. A ball of fire enveloped Mr. O'Brien, billowed through the kitchen, blew out both front and back door and every downstairs window. By some extraordinary miracle, Mr. O'Brien survived the blast and was catapulted, still clutching the receiver, through the drawing room window onto the gravel of his drive, as naked as ever Mr. Simplon had been, but blackened beyond belief, with his moustache and fringe of hair scorched to a tinder. Lockhart left his activities at that for the time being. The Crescent was swarming with police who had even invaded the bird sanctuary in search of hidden caches of IRA arms. Besides, he had other things to think about. A telegram had arrived from Mr. Dodd. It was quite simple, and with that economy of expression that was typical of the man. Come, Dodd. Lockhart went, leaving a tearful Jessica with the promise that he would be back soon. Mr. Dodd motioned to a three-legged milking stool. It's the old bitch, he said, not bothering with preliminaries. She serves the to kill the mine. Kill grandfather, said Lockhart, recognizing the man for what he was. Mr. Dodd always called Mr. Flaws the mine. Aye, first she overfeeds him. Then she waters his drink with brandy, and now she's taking to dampen his bed. But why should she want to kill him? said Lockhart. So she'll inherit before you find your father, said Mr. Dodd. And what good will that do her? Even after Grandfather dies, I've only to find my father and she loses her inheritance. True, said Mr. Dodd. But who's to say you'll find him? You'll have the deal's own job getting her out of the place once the man dies and you've no father to your name. She'll get the litigation and you've no money to fight her with. I will have, said Lockhart grimly. I'll have it by then. But then's too late, man, said Mr. Dodd. You might do something now. They sat in silence and considered possibilities. They were none of them nice. What if we tell Grandfather? said Lockhart. But Mr. Dodd shook his head. He's all consumed with guilt. I'm fit to die, he said. Guilt? said Lockhart. What guilt? Mr. Dodd gave him a quizzical look and said nothing. There's surely something we can do, Lockhart said after a long silence. My mind's been running to accidents, said Mr. Dodd, looking across at the top of the Peel Tower. It's been known to happen. Lockhart refused. She's family, he said. I wouldn't want to kill my wife's mother before I had to. Mr. Dodd nodded. He approved the sentiment. Having so little family himself, he treasured what he had. I'll tell her the story of Elston Tree, Lockhart said, finally. She'll think twice about hurrying grandfather to his grave after that. Dinner that night was a sombre affair. Mr. Flaws was in a guilty mood, and the sudden arrival of Lockhart had enhanced it. Mrs. Flaws was effusively welcoming, but her welcome died in the glower of Lockhart's scowl. It was only after dinner, when Mr. Flaws had retired to his study, that Lockhart spoke to his mother-in-law. "'You'll take a walk with me,' he said, as she dried her hands at the sink. "'A walk?' said Mrs. Flaws, and found her arm gripped above the elbow. "'Aye, a walk,' said Lockhart and propelled her into the dusk and across the yard to the Peel Tower. Inside it was dark and gloomy. Lockhart shut the great door and bolted it, and then lit a candle. "'What do you mean by this?' said Mrs. Flores. "'You've got no right!' But she was stopped by an unearthly sound that seemed to come from above, a shrill, weird sound that echoed the wind and yet had a melody. Mrs. Flores shrank back against the wall, and the candle flickered a great shadow among the tattered flags, and as she stared at Lockhart, he began to sing. An old man's take and a wicked wife, and the murder's to his bed, 
While all the while she did take his life and see him shortly dead. The grave's a place we all must gun when time is rolled away. But finish the deed you've just begun and you shall rue the day. Tuck heed, tuck heed and keep your head. For I, your daughter, don't. And would not want her mother dead because I slit your throat. So warn your husband's bed aright and see the sheets are dry, or else I'll seek ye out the night wherever ye may hide. And I would die to see thee die should any harm befall. The flaws who heard my birthday cry beneath a dry stone wall. Outside in the darkness, Mr. Flaws, called from his study by the sound of the pipes played on the battlements of the peel tower, stood by the door and listened intently as the ballad ended. What he had just heard left no room in his mind for doubt. The bastard was a true Flaws. And with that certainty there came a second. Lockhart was a throwback, born by eugenic circumstances out of time, with gifts the old man had never suspected and could not but admire. And finally, he was no bastard grandson. Mr. Flaws went into his study and locked the door. Then, sitting by the fire, he gave way privately to his grief and pride. Meanwhile, Mrs. Flaws cowered in the darkness of the banqueting hall and wondered at the remarkable insight Lockhart had shown into the workings of her own mind and hands. That night, Lockhart was back in Sandicott Crescent and had already made up his mind to deal with Colonel Finch Potter next. But first, there was the problem of the bull terrier to be overcome. The quantity of contraceptives deposited in the sewer below the colonel's outlet suggested that the old bachelor had private habits that were amenable to use. And so for the next week, Lockhart sat in a darkened room that overlooked number 10 and watched from 7 till midnight. It was on Friday that he saw the colonel's ancient humber drive up and a woman step out and enter the house with him. She was rather younger than Colonel Finch Potter and more gaudily dressed than most of the women who came to Sandicott Crescent. Ten minutes later, a light shone in the colonel's bedroom, and Lockhart had a better look at the woman. She came into the category his grandfather had described as scarlet women. Then the colonel drew the curtains. A few minutes later, the kitchen door opened, and the bull terrier was hustled out into the garden. The colonel evidently objected to its presence in the house at the same time as his scarlet woman. Lockhart went downstairs and across to the fence, and whistled quietly, and the bull terrier waddled over. Lockhart reached through and patted it, and the bull terrier wagged what there was of its tail. And so while the colonel made love to his lady friend upstairs, Lockhart made friends with the dog in the garden. He was still stroking the dog at midnight, and the front door opened and the couple came out and got into the humber. Lockhart noted the time and made his plans accordingly. End of Side Two Next day he travelled to London and hung around Soho. He sat in coffee bars and even strip shows, which disgusted him. And finally, by dint of striking up acquaintance with a sickly young man, he managed to buy what he had come to look for. He came home with several tiny tablets in his pocket and hid them in the garage. Lockhart slipped next door into number 10, carrying a tin of oven cleaner. The bull terrier welcomed him amiably, and together they went upstairs to the colonel's bedroom and through the drawers of his dressing table until Lockhart found what he was after. Then... With a pat on the head of the dog, he slipped out of the house and back over the fence. Colonel Finch Potter was vaguely aware that the contraceptive he was nudging over his penis felt more slippery than usual when he took it out of the box. But the full effect of the oven cleaner made itself felt when he had got it three quarters on and was nursing the rubber ring right down to achieve maximum protection for syphilis. The next moment, all fear of that contagious disease had fled his mind and far from trying to get the thing on, he was struggling to get the thing off as quickly as possible, before irremediable damage had been done. He was unsuccessful. Not only was the contraceptive slippery, but the oven cleaner was living up to its maker's claim to be able to remove grease baked onto the interior of a stove like lightning. With a scream of agony, Colonel Finch Potter gave up his manual efforts to get the contraceptive off before what felt like galloping leprosy took its fearful toll and dashed towards the bathroom in search of a pair of scissors. Behind him, the scarlet woman watched with growing apprehension, and when, after demonically hurling the contents of the medicine cabinet onto the floor, the colonel, still screaming, found his nail scissors, she intervened 
No, no, you mustn't, she cried in the mistaken belief that the colonel's guilt had got the better of him, that he was about to castrate himself. As the police car screeched to a halt outside number 10, and they bundled out to the scene of the latest crime, they were met by the bull terrier. It was not the amiable beast it had been previously. It was an entirely new species of beast, one filled to the brim with LSD by Lockhart. Gnashing its teeth, it bit the first three policemen out of the panda car, went snarling off into the night in search of fresh victims. It found them aplenty. Mr. and Mrs. Lowry had taken to sleeping downstairs since the explosion of Mr. O'Brien's house next door, and the commotion next door brought them into the garden. Colonel Finch Potter's illuminated bull terrier found them there, and having bitten them both to the bone and driven them back into the house, had severed three rose bushes at the stem with total disregard for their thorns. Mr. Pettigrew had just opened the front door when something shot between his legs and up the stairs. Mr. Pettigrew misguidedly shut the door. The next twenty minutes, Colonel Finch Potter's bull terrier ravaged the Pettigrew house. Finally, it leapt at its own reflection in the French windows and crashed through into the night. After that, its howls could be heard horrifically from the bird sanctuary. Colonel Finch Potter's howls had long since ceased. He lay on the kitchen floor with the cheese grater and worked assiduously and with consummate courage on the thing that had been his penis. But the corrosive contraceptive had long since disintegrated under the striations of the bread knife he neither knew nor cared. It was sufficient to know that the rubber ring remained, that his penis had swollen to three times its normal size. It was in an insane effort to grate it down from a phallic gargoyle to something more precise that the colonel worked. And besides, the pain of the cheese grater was positively homeopathic compared to oven cleaner, and came as something of a relief, albeit a minor one. Behind him, garnished in suspender belt and bra, the scarlet woman had hysterics in the kitchen chair, and it was her shrieks that finally drove the three terrified policemen out of their patrol car to their duty. Bloody and bowed, they broke the front door down in a wild rush, provoked as much by fear of the bull terrier as by any desire to enter the house. Once they were in, they were in half a dozen minds whether to stay or go. The sight of a puce-faced old gentleman sitting naked on the kitchen floor using a cheese grater on what looked like a pumpkin with high blood pressure was not one to reassure them. The Pettigrews, emerging finally from the closet under the stairs, surveyed the remnants of their furniture and wept. There's some terrible curse on the street, wailed Mrs. Pettigrew, echoing Lockhart's prayer. I won't stay here a moment longer. Mr. Pettigrew tried in vain to adopt a more rational approach, but he wasn't helped by the demented howls of the bull terrier, the bird sanctuary. Mr. and Mrs. Lowry were busily trying to bandage one another in portions of anatomy least amenable to bandaging, and were considering suing Colonel Finch Potter for his dog's damage. Next door, Mrs. Simplon, convinced that her husband was trying to break in to retrieve his belongings, proceeded to warn him off by loading a shotgun and firing it out of the window at nothing in particular. Not being the best shot in the world, she managed with the first shot to blast the greenhouse in the garden of the Ogilvies at number three. Not to be dissuaded, but rather encouraged by the screams and yells of the scarlet woman who was being dragged into the police car, and convinced now that the IRA had struck again, she reloaded and loosed off two more barrels in the general direction of Mr. O'Brien's former house. Outside Colonel Finch Potter's, the policemen hastily dropped their burden, took cover, and radioed for armed assistance. It was no time at all coming. Sirens sounded, police cars converged, and under covering fire, a dozen men surrounded Mrs. Simplon's mock Georgian mansion and ordered everyone inside to come out with their hands up. Dressing as swiftly as she could, she went through the connecting door in the garage and hid in the sump pit. There, with the wood pulled over her head, she waited. When dawn finally broke over the crescent, fifteen policemen broke cover, the front and back door, four windows, and found the house to be empty. Cowering beneath the wooden beams in the inspection pit under her car, her nerves were in tatters. She fumbled in her bag for her cigarettes, found one, and was in the process of striking a match to light it when the superintendent made his way past the garage door. In fact, the garage door made its way past him. Mrs. Simplon had discovered to her cost that inspection pits filled with oil waste and petrol fumes were not the best place to light cigarettes. Mrs. Simplon's hopes of calming her nerves succeeded beyond her wildest dreams was no longer conscious after the first explosion. By the time the oil tanks exploded, she had passed into the great beyond. In the middle of this holocaust, the superintendent kept his head. He kept little else. Left standing in his boots and leather belt, he was a blackened, scorched, 
thoroughly disenchanted copper. Once again the sirens sounded on the approaches to Sandicott Crescent. This time it was the fire brigade. As they worked frantically to extinguish the flames, which flames had already extinguished Mrs. Simplon so thoroughly that she was in no need of a more ceremonial cremation, the bull terrier made its last sortie. With blood-red eyes and lolling tongue, it lumbered out of the bird sanctuary, through the Mrs. Musgrove's herb garden, and having whetted its appetite on the calf of a fireman, proceeded to engage one of the fire brigade's hose pipes in mortal combat in the belief that it was wrestling with an anaconda in the ancestral forest of its dreams. The hose pipe fought back. Punctured in a dozen places, it shot water into the air with enormous pressure and carried the bull terrier several feet off the ground where it hung a moment, snarling ravenously. Baffled by the liquid resistance of the writhing hose pipes, the bull terrier sank its teeth into the superintendent's legs, let go momentarily to re-engage the hose, which it savaged in several more places, and then hurled itself at the superintendent's throat. This time the superintendent moved, and his juniors, twenty firemen, and the remaining residents of Sandicott Crescent were privileged to see a naked and badly scorched policeman in boots and belt cover one hundred metres in under ten seconds from a standing start. The superintendent hurtled to the gravel's gate, clobbered across their lawn and into the bird sanctuary. And presently, in harmony with the dog, he too could be heard howling for help. Convinced that the blazing garage was a diversion to allow the gunmen inside the house, who had eluded their search, to make good their escape under cover of the smoke, armed police lurked in the adjacent gardens and in the foliage of the bushes by the golf course. It was in consequence of this and of the smoke that obscured their view and that of an early foursome, one of whom had an incurable slice, that a ball hit an armed constable on the head. They're coming at us from the rear, yelled the constable, and emptied his revolver into the drifting smoke, hitting the man with the now terminal slice and the clubhouse. He was followed by several other policemen, who fired in the general direction of the screams. Four golfers fell on the 18th, two on the 1st, while on the 9th, a number of women clustered together in a bunker they had previously done their best to avoid. The contingent of police who arrived at the clubhouse, armed now with rifles as well as revolvers, stationed themselves in the bar. The secretary's office and the changing room answered their comrades' desultory fire with a positive barrage of their own. Five minutes later, helicopter gunships were hovering over the golf course, searching for the enemy. But the police in the Simplon's garden had had their fill. Three lay wounded, one was dead, and the rest were out of ammunition. Dragging their wounded, they wormed their way across the lawn and round the side of the house, and ran for the police cars. Get the hell out of here! They yelled as they scrambled in. There's a fucking army out there! A moment later, the patrol cars had left the Crescent. They were heading towards the police station. Donning his wetsuit, Lockhart crawled along to the outlet of Mr. Gravel's house with a bucket and a World War II stirrup pump. Having introduced the nozzle into the discharge pipe and cemented it there with putty, Lockhart filled the bucket from the sewer and began to pump vigorously. He worked steadily for an hour, and then undid his apparatus and crawled home. By that time, Mr. Gravel's ground floor was awash with the effluent from every other house in the street, and all his attempts to get his ground floor lavatory to behave in the normal manner and discharge excreta out of the house rather than pump it in had failed disastrously. Driven to desperate measures and wading through sewage with his trousers rolled up, Mr. Gravel had seized on the idea of using caustic soda. It was not a good idea. Instead of going down the pipe to unblock whatever infernal thing was blocking it, the caustic soda erupted from the pan in an extremely vindictive fashion. Fortunately, Mr. Gravel had had the good sense to foresee this possibility and was out of the tiny room when it happened. He was less sensible in resorting to an ordinary lavatory cleanser, and when that failed, adding to it liquid bleach. The two combined to produce chlorine, and Mr. Gravel was driven from his house by the poisonous gas. Standing on the back lawn, he watched his living room carpet lap up the foul liquid the caustic soda eat into his best armchair. Lockhart, divesting himself of the wetsuit, ran himself a bath and lay in it contentedly. On the whole, he thought he'd done rather well. There could be no doubting now that Jessica would be in full possession of her inheritance and with the right to sell every house whenever she chose. He lay thinking about the tax problem. His experience at Sandicott and Partners had told him that capital gains tax was levied on every extra house an individual owned. There had to be some way round it. The tax on twelve houses would be enormous. By the time he got out of the bath, he had found a simple solution. Nobody else could find a simple solution to the problem of what had occurred in East Pursley. The discovery by an army helicopter of the superintendent of police hanging to the upper branches of a monkey puzzle tree, which would have defied the efforts of any but the most insane man to climb, 
didn't help clarify matters. He kept screaming about mad dogs being loose in the neighborhood, and his statement was supported by Mr. Pettigrew and the Lowrys, who had wounds to prove it. It hardly explains how six golfers and five of my own men came to be shot, said the Commissioner of Police. Well, I suppose we could divide the two incidents into separate areas, suggested the Assistant Commissioner. Two! Two! he yelled, rattling the windows of his office. One! We have an utterly insane half-pay colonel whittling his prick with a cheese grater in the company of a high-class whore. Two, we have a mad dog roaming the district, biting everything in sight. Three, someone looses off firearms into several houses and then explodes a fucking garage with an unidentifiable woman in the inspection pit. Do I have to spread it all out for you? I take your point, said the assistant commissioner, which, according to Miss Gigi Lamont, is what Colonel Finch Potter... Shut up, said the commissioner savagely, and crossed his legs. They sat in silence and considered a convincing explanation. Well, at least the TV people and the press weren't present, said the assistant commissioner, and his superior nodded thankfully. What about blaming the IRA? What, and give them something else to boast about? You must be out of your mind. Well, they did blow up Mr. O'Brien's house. Nonsense! The sod blew himself up. There wasn't a trace of explosive in the house, said the commissioner. He was fiddling with the gas stove. But he wasn't connected to the gas main, the AC began. And I won't be connected to my job unless we come up with something before noon, shouted the commissioner. First of all, we've got to stop the press going in there and asking questions. Got any ideas on the subject? The assistant commissioner considered the problem. I don't suppose we could say the mad dogs had rabies, he said finally. I mean, we could put the area in quarantine and shoot anything. We've already shot half the police in that patch, said the commissioner. And while I'm inclined to agree that they were mad... You still don't go round shooting people who've contracted rabies. You inoculate the brutes. Still, it would serve to keep the press and the media out. And how do you explain the six beating golfers? Just because some fool slices his drive, you don't have a drive to slice him and five others with multiple gunshot wounds. And we've got to come up with some logical explanation. Sticking to the rabies theory, said the assistant commissioner, if one of our men contracted rabies and went berserk, you can't contract rabies instantaneously. It takes weeks to come out. If they were a special sort of rabies, a new variety like swine fever, persisted the assistant. The dog bites the colonel. That's out for a start. There's no evidence that anybody bit Colonel Finch fucking Potter except himself. And that's in an anatomically impossible place, unless the bastard was a contortionist as well as a pervert. But he's not in a fit condition to deny the rabies theory, said the assistant commissioner. He's clean off his rocker. Not the only thing he's off, muttered the commissioner. But all right, go on. We start with galloping rabies and the dog, and everything follows quite logically. The armed squad go off their heads and start shooting. That's going to sound great on the nine o'clock news. Five officers of the special squad, organized to protect foreign diplomats, this morning went mad and shot six golfers on the East Bursley Golf Course. I know there's no such thing as bad publicity, but in this case I have my doubts. Well, we could invoke the Official Secrets Act, said the AC. The commissioner nodded approvingly. We need the cooperation of the War Office for that, he said. Well, those helicopters could have come from Porton Down. Yeah, they just happened to have come from somewhere else. And anyway, they came after the show was over. But they don't know that, said the assistant commissioner. You know how dim the army command is. In the end, it was agreed at a joint meeting of the Home Secretary, the Ministry of Defence and the Commissioner of Police that the happenings at Sandicott Crescent were subject to official silence. And invoking the Defence of the Realm Act, together with the Official Secrets Act, the editors of all papers were ordered not to publicise the tragedy. Sandicott Crescent was sealed off, and army marksmen went through the bird sanctuary with rifles, killing everything that moved as an exercise in stopping the spread of rabies. Fortunately for the bull terrier, it didn't move. It slept on and on outside the colonel's kitchen door. It was about the only creature, apart from Lockhart and Jessica, who didn't move. Mr. Gravel, driven from his house by the upsurge of the sewer, handed in his notice that afternoon wearing a pair of bedroom slippers over his chemically cauterized feet. The Rickenshaws and the Pettigrews spent the afternoon packing. They, too, left before dark. The Lowrys had already left and were being given rabies inoculations in the company of several firemen, the police superintendent, and a number of his men at the local isolation hospital. Even Mrs. Simplon had gone, a small, sinister plastic bag which so upset Mrs. Ogilvy that she had to be sedated. A week later, the Ogilvys, too, left, and Lockhart and Jessica could look out their bedroom window at eleven empty houses, each standing, with the exception of Mr. O'Brien which had slumped somewhat. As the builders moved in to restore the houses to their pristine state, and in the case of Mr. Gravel's to a sanitary one, Lockhart had time to turn his attention to other things. There was, for instance, the little matter of Miss Genevieve Goldring's forthcoming novel to be considered. Song of the Heart was published in October, 
and Lockhart and Jessica watched it climb from nine on the bestsellers list to two within three weeks, and finally to the top. It was then that Lockhart struck. He travelled to London with a copy of the novel and spent part of an afternoon in the office of Gibling and Gibling, solicitors. By the time he left, the Giblings were in transports of legal rhapsody. Never in all their experience, and old Mr. Gibling had had a great deal of experience in matters concerning libel, never had they come across a more blatant and outrageously wicked libel. Four hundred thousand pounds damages? Do my ears deceive me? said Mr. Folsom, solicitor for Mrs. Shortstead, publishers. I have never in all my career read anything so monstrous. Giblings have gone mad. Of course you will contest. For once Mr. Folsom erred. Mr. Shortstead, taking his advice instead of his own intuition, which told him that Song of the Heart was somehow a little different in tone from Miss Goldring's other numerous novels, instructed his assistant to answer in kind and reversing the natural order of things, to tell Mr. Gibling to sue and be damned. The trial was held in the High Court of Justice, Queen's Bench Division, before Mr. Justice Plummery. Mr. Widdishins acted for the defendants, and Mr. Fescue had been instructed by Mr. Gibling and Mr. Gibling. The latter were in raptures. Mr. Justice Plummery had a reputation for barbarous impartiality and a loathing for quibbling barristers. There was no recourse open to Mr. Widdishins but to quibble. And to add to the difficulties of the defence, there was Miss Goldring, who, if she couldn't win the case, was determined to lose it as flamboyantly as possible. It's all a damned lie, she shouted. I never had that little shit to tea, and I never used the name Lockhart fucking flaws in any of my books. But it's there in the song of... Mr. Shortstead began. Shut up, said Miss Goldring. If it's there, you must have put it there, because it wasn't in the manuscript I sent you. I'm quite sure about that, said Mr. Widdishins looking for some ray of hope in an otherwise hopeless case. I swear by almighty God, said Miss Goldring, with a vehemence that was convincing, that I have never, ever heard the name flaws in my life, let alone used it in a book. What followed was a tirade from the witness box on the iniquities of publishers and editors. When she had finished, Mr. Fescue turned to Mr. Justice Plummery. And would it not be as well to examine the original manuscript and compare it with others submitted by the defendant to her publishers, Marant? he asked. Defendants have no objections, said Mr. Widdishins, and the court adjourned. Later that afternoon, two experts on graphology and typography testified that the manuscript of Song of the Heart had been written, typed, and produced by precisely the same machine as King's Closet and Maid of the Moors, both books written by Miss Goldring. Mr. Fescue continued his cross-examination of the defendant. Having established beyond all possible doubt that you wrote Song of the Heart, he said, is it not also true that you were and are acquainted with the plaintiff, Mr. Lockhart Flaws? Miss Goldring began a violent denial. But Mr. Fescue stopped her. Before you commit perjury, he said, I would ask you to consider the evidence given under oath by Mr. Flaws that you invited him into your house and plied him with crème de menthe. In the witness box, Miss Goldring stared at him with starting eyes. How did you know that? she asked. Mr. Fescue smiled and looked to the judge and jury. Because Mr. Flaws told me under oath yesterday, he said gaily. Miss Goldring shook her head. About the creme de menthe, she said weakly. Because the plaintiff also told me, though in private, said Mr. Fescue. You do, I take it, drink creme de menthe. Yes, said Miss Goldring. Below her, Mr. Widdishins and Mr. Shortstead both covered their eyes with their hands. Mr. Fescue resumed his route. Is it not also true that the carpet in your bedroom is blue-flecked with gold, that your bed is heart-shaped, that beside it stands a mauve pleated lampshade, that your cat's name is Pinky? Are these facts not all true? There was no doubting their veracity. The look on Miss Goldring's face spoke for her. Mr. Fescue had his facts right. He had heard them from Lockhart, who in turn had them from Jessica. So that continued Mr. Fescue, without your permission, Mr. Flaws could not have been able to testify in a signed affidavit that when you invited him into the house you did so of your own free will and with the intention of seducing him. And having failed of that purpose, you set out deliberately and with malice aforethought to destroy his marriage, reputation, and means of livelihood by portraying him in a novel as a thief, a pervert, and a murderer. Is that not also true? No, shrieked Miss Goldring. No, it isn't. I never invited him in. Never. I have no more questions of the witness, said Mr. Fescue, and sat down. In his summing up, Mr. Justice Plummery maintained that ferocious impartiality for which he was famous. 
Miss Goldring's evidence and behaviour in and out of the witness box had left no doubt in his mind that she was a liar, a prostitute in both the literary and sexual meanings of the word, and that she had maliciously set out to do what Mr. Fescue had maintained. The jury retired for two minutes and found the libel proved was left to the judge to estimate the damages, both personal and financial, to the plaintiff as being of the order of one million pounds sterling. That afternoon there was jubilation in the offices of Mr. Gibling and Mr. Gibling, and at number 12, Sandicott Crescent. Beastly woman, said Jessica, to think I used to love her books, and they were all lies. Lockhart nodded. And now we can start to sell the houses, too, he said. But after so much unfortunate publicity, we can't possibly stay in this neighbourhood. As the winter months rolled by, the money rolled in. Messrs. Shortstead's insurance company paid one million pounds into Lockhart's bank account in the city, and money rolled into Jessica's account at East Pursley. And the for sale notices came down and new occupiers moved in. Lockhart had timed his campaign of eviction with financial precision. Property values were up. Not one of the houses went for less than fifty thousand pounds. By Christmas, Jessica's account stood at £478,000. Her standing with the bank manager, even higher. He offered her financial advice and suggested she should invest the money. Lockhart told her not to do anything so foolish. He had plans for that money, and they had nothing to do with stocks and shares, and even less to do with capital gains tax, which the bank manager was at pains to point out she would inevitably have to pay. Lockhart smiled confidently and went about footling in the workshop in the garden helped to pass the time while the houses were sold, and besides, ever since his success as a radio mechanic in the Wilson's attic, he had become quite an expert and had bought all the necessary ingredients for a hi-fi system, which he then constructed. In fact, he went in for gadgetry with all his grandfather's enthusiasm for breeding hounds, and in no time at all, number 12 was wired for sound so that Lockhart, moving from room to room, could, by the mere manipulation of a pocket tuner, switch one loudspeaker off and another one on, and generally accompany himself musically wherever he went. And in just the same way he could play his tapes all day, he could record as long and in whatever room he happened to be. Every so often he would find himself breaking out into song, strange songs, blood and battle and feuds over cattle, which were surprising to him as they were out of place in the Sandicate Crescent and seemed to spring spontaneously from some inner source beyond his comprehension. Lockhart's mind dwelt less on these subtleties than on the practical problems facing him. The words and the wild music came out only occasionally when he was not feeling himself. And here, it has to be admitted, he was increasingly feeling himself in ways which his grandfather, a devotee of that fowler whose great work, Usage and Self-Abusage, the old man's guide in matters of masturbation, would have deplored. The strain of not imposing himself upon his angelic Jessica had begun to tell, and sexual fantasies began to fester in his mind as he tinkered in his workshop with a soldering iron. There were moments when he considered assuaging his desire in Jessica, but Lockhart thrust the idea from him and used the sheepskin buffer on the electric drill instead. It was not a satisfactory remedy, but it sufficed for the present. One day, when he was master of Floors Hall and owner of 5,000 acres, he would raise a family. Not till then. In the meantime, he and Jessica would live chaste lives and resort to the electric drill and manual method. Lockhart's reasoning was primitive, but it stemmed from the feeling that he had yet to master his fate, and until that moment came, he was impure. It came sooner than he expected. In late December, the phone rang. It was Mr. Bullstrode calling from Hexham. Ah, boy, he said in somber tones, I have bad news. Your father, I mean your grandfather, is dangerously ill. Dr. McGrew sees little hope of his recovering. I think you should come at once. Lockhart, with death in his heart, for old Mrs. Flaws, drove north, leaving Jessica in tears. Is there nothing I can do to help? she asked. But Lockhart shook his head. If his grandfather was dying, thanks to anything old Mrs. Flaws had done, he did not want the presence of her daughter to hinder his plans for the old witch. But when he drove over the track to the gated bridge below the hall, it was to learn from Mr. Dodd that the man had fallen, if not of his own volition, at least unassisted by his wife, who had been in the kitchen garden at the time. Mr. Dodd could vouch for that. No banana skins, said Lockhart. None, said Mr. Dodd. I slept in his study and hit his head on the coal scuttle. I heard him fall and carried him upstairs. Lockhart went upstairs, and brushing Mrs. Flaws's lamentations aside with a hush, woman, went into his grandfather's bedroom. The old man was lying in bed. Beside him sat Dr. McGrew, feeling Mr. Flaws's pulse.
He could go at any moment, said the doctor, and then again he may linger for months. It is a hope much to be desired, said Mr. Dodd, looking significantly at Lockhart. I can I die before the father's found? Lockhart nodded. The same thought was in his mind. And that night, after Dr. McGrew had left, Lockhart and Mr. Dodd sat in the kitchen and conferred. The first thing to see to is that woman doesn't go near him, said Mr. Dodd. She'll stifle a man with a pillow and she but half the chance. Go and lock her door, said Lockhart. You'll feed her through the keyhole. Now then, he mustn't die. A bellow of oaths from upstairs indicated Mr. Flaws was living up to his hopes. It does that every now and then. Shouts and abominates the likes of all around. Does he indeed? said Lockhart. You put me in mind of an idea. And the next morning he was up and away, over the broken road and down through Hexham to Newcastle. He spent the day in the radio and hi-fi shops and returned with a carload of equipment. Lockhart unpacked a tape recorder, and presently he was sitting by the old man's bed while his grandfather shouted abominations into the microphone. Hey, a damned stalking swine of a block-hearted scot, he yelled, as Lockhart fixed the throat mic round his neck. I'll have no more of your proving and pestering, and take that satanic stethoscope away from my chest, you bloody leech. That's not my heart that's gonna die, but my head... And all night he blathered on against the infernal world and its iniquities, while Lockhart and Mr. Dodd took turns to switch the tape recorder on and off. That night the snow set in, and the road across floors fell became impossible. Mr. Dodd heaped coals on the fire in the bedroom, and Mr. Flaws mistook them for the flames of hell. His language became accordingly more violent. Whatever else, he was not going gently into that dark underworld in which he had professed such unbelief. I see you, you devil, he shouted. By Lucifer, I'll have you by the tail. Get you going. And ever and anon, he rambled. That's a dig with her, ma'am, good ditty, he said quite cheerfully. The hounds will have a scent, the duke. Would to our young again and could ride the pack. Between these outbursts, he slept and slowly slipped away. Lockhart and Mr. Dodd sat in front of the kitchen fire and laid their plans for his imminent end. Lockhart had been particularly impressed by the old man's repeated wish not to be buried. Mr. Dodd, on the other hand, pointed out that he didn't want to be cremated either, if his attitude to the fire in the bedroom was anything to go by. It's either one or t'other, he said one night. It keep while the cold lasts, but I doubt it'd be pleasant company come the summer. It was Lockhart who found the solution one evening, as he stood in the peel tower and stared at the dusty flags and the ancient weapons and heads that hung on the wall. And when, in the cold hour before dawn, old Mr. Flores, muttering a last imprecation on the world, passed from it, Lockhart was ready. Keep the tape recorders going today, he told Mr. Dodd, and let no one see him. Lockhart switched the tape from record to play, and from beyond the shadow of death, old Mr. Flores' voice echoed through the house. And having shown Mr. Dodd how to change the cassettes to avoid too much repetition, he left the house and headed across the fell. That night, Mr. Taglioni, taxidermist and specialist in permanent preservation of 5 Brunston Road, was interrupted in his work on a Mrs. Pritchard's late poodle, Oliver, and called to the front door. In the darkness outside stood a tall figure whose face was largely obscured by a scarf and a peaked hat. Yes, said Mr. Taglioni. Can I help you? Perhaps, said the figure. You live alone. Mr. Taglioni nodded a trifle nervously. It was one of the disadvantages of his occupation that few women seemed disposed to share a house with a man whose livelihood consisted of stuffing other things, and those dead. I'm told you are an excellent taxidermist, said the figure, pushing past Mr. Taglioni into the passage. I am, said Mr. Taglioni proudly. Can you stuff anything? There was skepticism in the voice. Anything you care to mention, said Mr. Taglioni. Fish, fox, fowl or pheasant, you name it, I'll stuff it. Lockhart named it. Benvenuto Cellini, said Mr. Taglioni, lapsing into his native tongue. Mamma mia, you can't be serious. But Lockhart was. Producing an enormous revolver from his raincoat pocket, he pointed it at Mr. Taglioni. But it's not legal. It's unheard of. It's... The revolver poked in his belly. I'll give you ten minutes to collect your tools and anything else you need, and then we'll go. Ten minutes later, a blindfolded and partially demented taxidermist 
was bundled into the back seat of the car and driven north. Four o'clock in the morning, they entered the hall. Lockhart unlocked the door to the wine cellar. The body of the late Mr. Flores was lying on the table. Never in my life have I been called upon to stuff a person, Taglioni muttered, rummaging in his bag. Why are you asking him, Balmer? Because I want the joints to move. Legs and arms and neck, maybe, but hips is impossible. Either standing or sitting, he must be one or the other. Sitting, said Lockhart. No work. And so, while his widow lay sleeping upstairs, unaware of her recent but long-awaited bereavement, the grisly task of stuffing Mr. Flaws began in the cellar. The business of carrying buckets upstairs and disposing of their ghastly contents in the cucumber frames, where they couldn't be seen because of the snow on the glass above, was not one to be relished. They may do the cucumbers a world of good, muttered Dodd on his fifth trip, but I'm damned if they do me. I won't be able to touch cucumbers again without thinking of the poor old devil. When she did wake, the old man could be heard shouting from his bedroom, and in the cellar Mr. Taglioni listened and felt terrible. Mr. Dodd didn't feel much better. He went down to the cellar and complained to Lockhart. Why can't we use the earth closet instead? Because he didn't want to be buried, and I'll see his wishes carried out, said Lockhart. I wish he'd carry out a few of his innards as well, said Mr. Dodd, bitterly. When Lockhart inadvisedly left the cellar for a moment, he returned to find that the taxidermist had, to relieve the strain of emptying Mr. Flaws, filled himself with two bottles of that late gentleman's crusted port. The combination of a drunk taxidermist elbow deep in his lamented employer was too much for Mr. Dodd. He staggered up the stairs and was greeted by the unearthly voice of the late Mr. Flores bellowing imprecations from the bedroom. The devil take the lot of you, you blood-sucking swine of Satan! You couldn't be trusted not to steal the last morsel of meat from a starving beggar! The late man bawled very appositely. And when an hour later Lockhart came up and suggested that something substantial for lunch like liver and bacon might help the taxidermist sober up, Mr. Dodd would have none of it. You'll cook whatever you damn well please, he said, but I'll no be eating meat this side of candlemice. The eyes? Taglioni shouted. My God, I forgot to bring his eyes. Now what are we going to do? I'll bring some, Lockhart said. Don't worry, I'll fetch a pair. When he returned, he was carrying the glass eyes of the tiger his grandfather had shot in India on his trip there in 1910. He thought they would do rather well. Old Mr. Flaws had always been a ferocious man eater. All that day and the next, and the one following, Mr. Taglioni continued his gruesome task. While Lockhart cooked, Mr. Dodd sat in his shed and stared resentfully at the cucumber frames. In her bedroom, Mrs. Flores had stood all she could of her blasted husband's voice echoing from across the landing, of heaven and hell, guilt, sin and damnation. If the old fool wouldn't die or stop repeating himself, she wouldn't have minded, but he went on and on and on, and by the third night Mrs. Flores was prepared to brave the snow, sleet and storm and even heights to escape. She tied her sheets together, and then tore her blankets into strips and knotted them to the sheets, the sheets to the bed, and finally donning her warmest clothes, she clambered out of the window and slid rather than climbed to the ground. The night was dark and the snow melted. Against the black background of mud and moor she was invisible. She slushed off down the drive towards the bridge and had just crossed it and was trying to undo the gates and behind her she heard the baying of hounds. She turned from the gate and ran or rather stumbled alongside the cut in a desperate attempt to reach the hillside by the tunnel and as she ran she heard the creak of the wooden gates to the yard and the louder baying of the hounds. The floor's pack was on the scent again. Mrs. Flores fled on into the darkness, tripped and fell, got up, tripped again and this time fell into the cut. It wasn't deep, but the cold was intense. She tried to climb the far bank, but slipped back, giving up, waded on, knee-deep in icy water, towards the dark shadow of the hill, the darker hole of the great tunnel. It loomed larger and more awful with each uncertain step she took. Mrs. Flores hesitated. The black hole ahead spoke to her of Hades, the baying pack behind of Pluto, no gay cartoon of Disneyland, but rather that dread god of the infernal regions at whose altar of mere wealth she had unconsciously worshipped. Mrs. Flores was not an educated woman, but she knew enough to tell that she was caught between the devil and, by way of taps, toilets, and sewers provided by the Gateshead and Newcastle waterworks, 
the deep blue sea. And then as she hesitated, the baying hounds were halted in their tracks, and against the skyline she could see in silhouette a figure on a horse thrashing about him with a whip. Get back, you scum! shouted Lockhart. Back to your kennels, you scavengers of hell! His voice drifting with the wind reached Mrs. Flores, and for once she felt grateful to her son-in-law. A moment later she knew better. Addressing Mr. Dodd as he had addressed the hounds, Lockhart cursed the man for his stupidity. Have you forgotten the will, you damned old fool? he demanded. Let the old bitch but go one mile beyond the radius of the hall and she will forfeit the estate. So let her run and be damned! I hadn't thought of that, said Mr. Dodd contritely, and turned his horse to follow the pack back to Flores Hall, while Lockhart rode behind. Mrs. Flores no longer hesitated. She, too, had forgotten the clause in the will. She would not run and be damned. With a desperate effort, she scrambled from the cut and stumbled back to the hall. Mrs. Flores needed a drink, a strong drink to warm her blood. She stepped quietly to the cellar door and opened it. A moment later, her screams echoed and re-echoed through the house, there before her very eyes, naked and with an enormous scar from groin to gullet, sat old Mr. Flaws on a bare wood table, stained with blood, and his eyes were the eyes of a tiger. Behind him stood Mr. Taglioni, with a piece of cotton waste which he appeared to be stuffing into her husband's skull. While he worked, he hummed a tune from the Barber of Seville. Mrs. Flaws took one look, and having screamed, passed out. It was Lockhart who carried her, gibbering, dementedly, back to her room dropped her on the bed. Then he hauled up the sheets and blankets and knotted her to the bedstead. Down in the cellar, Mr. Taglioni gibbered. Mrs. Flores's eruption and hysteria in the cellar had completed his demoralization. It had been bad enough to stuff a dead man, but to have his work interrupted in the middle of the night by a wailing widow had been too much for him. Take me home, he pleaded with Lockhart. Take me home. Not before you've finished, said Lockhart, implacable. He's got to speak and wave his hands. Mr. Taglioni looked up at the masked face. Taxi there is one thing, Mario, that's another, he said. You want him stuffed? You got him stuffed. Now you say I gotta make him speak. What do you want? Miracles? You better ask God for those. I'm not asking anyone. I'm telling, said Lockhart, and produced the small loudspeaker. You put that where his larynx is. Was said Mr. Taglioni. I don't leave nothing inside. Was then, continued Lockhart. And then I want this receiver put in his head. He showed Mr. Taglioni the miniature receiver. And while you're about it, I want his jaw to move. I have an electric motor here. Look, I'll show you. For the rest of the morning, the late Mr. Flores was wired for sound. By the time they had finished, it was possible to hear his heart beat when a switch was pulled. Even his eyes, now those of the tiger, swiveled in his head at the touch of a button on the remote control. About the only thing he couldn't do was walk or lie down flat. But the rest, he looked rather healthier than he had done of late, and certainly sounded as articulate. Right, said Lockhart, when they had tested him out. Now you can drink your fill. I'll need your help, Dodd, to get the old man to bed, he said. He's stuff in the hip joints and needs levering round corners. Mr. Dodd demurred. But eventually, between them, they got Mr. Flores clad in his red flannel nightgown into bed, where he sat up bellowing, calling on the Almighty to save his soul. You've got to admit, it's very realistic, said Lockhart. It's just a pity we didn't think of taping his utterances earlier. It's more a pity we ever thought of taping them at all, said Mr. Dodd, drunkenly, and I wish his jaw wouldn't go up and down like that. It puts me in mind of a goldfish with asthma. But the eyes are about right said Lockhart. I got them from the tiger. You don't have to tell me, said Mr. Dodd, surprisingly broken to Blake. Tiger, tiger, burning bright down the forests of the night. What demented hand that I framed thy awful circuitry. I'm fixing him a wheelchair, said Lockhart proudly, so that he can move about the house on his own, and I'll direct it by remote control. That way no one will suspect he isn't still alive. End of side three.
Down in the cellar, Mr. Taglioni was drinking himself insensible on crusted port. He sat surrounded by empty bottles, proclaiming in garbled tones that he was the finest stuffer in the world. Mr. Taglioni's repeated boast that he was the world's finest stuffer, and the ambiguity of that remark gave Lockhart pause for thought. But the screams of Mrs. Flaws, rising to a crescendo that drowned even old Mr. Flaws's family history, and Mr. Taglioni's garbled utterances, decided Lockhart to go to her relief. By the time he unlocked the bedroom door, she was screaming that if she didn't have a pea soon, it was less a question of anyone else dying than of her bursting. Lockhart untied her, and she wobbled to the earth closet. When she returned to the kitchen, Lockhart had made up his mind. I have found my father, he announced. Mrs. Flores stared at him with loathing. You're a liar, she said, a liar and a murderer. I saw what you had done to your grandfather. Between them, Lockhart and Mr. Dodd dragged Mrs. Flores up to her room and tied her again to the bed. This time they gagged her. I told you the odd witch knew too much, said Mr. Dodd, and since she's loved for money, she'll not die without it. Threaten her how you may. Then we must forestall her, said Lockhart, and went down to the cellar. Mr. Taglioni, on his fifth bottle, regarded him hazily through bloodshot eyes. Daddy, said Lockhart, and put his arm round Mr. Taglioni's shoulder affectionately. My own dear daddy. Daddy? Who's fucking daddy? said Mr. Taglioni, too drunk to appreciate the new role he was being cast in. Lockhart helped him to his feet and up the stairs. I know you're fucking daddy, he said. I don't know what you're talking about. Lockhart got up and went to his grandfather's study and unlocked the safe. When he returned, he was carrying a wash leather bag. He beckoned to Mr. Taglioni to come to the table, and then emptied the bag's contents out in front of him. A thousand gold sovereigns littered the scrubbed pine table. Mr. Taglioni goggled at them. For me? You pay me in gold for stuffing a man? But Lockhart shook his head. No, Daddy. Or someone else. For being my father. Lockhart. Mr. Taglioni's eyes swiveled on his head almost as incredulously as the tigers did at the old man. Your father? He gasped. You want me to be your father? For why should I be your father? You must have one already. So even a bastard must have a father. Your mother was a virgin? You leave my mother out of this, said Lockhart. Mr. Dodd shoved a poker into the glowing fire of the range. By the time it was red hot, Mr. Taglioni had made up his mind. Lockhart's alternatives left him little choice. Okay, I agree. I tell this Mr. Balstrone, your father, I don't mind. You pay me this money, it's fine with me. Anything you say. That night, Mr. Dodd drove to Hexham to inform Mr. Bulstrode that he and Dr. McGrew were required next day at the hall to certify the sworn statement of Lockhart's father that he was indeed responsible for Miss Flaws's pregnancy. Lockhart and Mr. Taglioni sat on in the kitchen while the Italian learnt his line. Upstairs, Mrs. Flores struggled with her own. She had made up her mind that nothing, not even the prospect of a fortune, was going to keep her lying there in wait for a similar end to that of her husband. Unable to express herself vocally because of the gag, she concentrated on the ropes that tied her to the iron bedstead. She pushed her hand down and pulled them back again over and over with a tenacity that was a measure of her fear. Mr. Taglioni's appearance did not inspire confidence. The taxidermist had been through too many inexplicable horrors to be at his best, and while Lockhart had spent half the night seeing to it that his father was word-perfect in his new role, drink, fear, and sleeplessness had done nothing to improve his looks. Mr. Bulstrode looked at him with dismay, and Dr. McGrew with medical concern. Mr. Bulstrode swallowed. Would it not be more proper to have present your grandfather and his wife? he inquired. After all, the one drew the will and last testament up, and the other would appear to be about to be deprived of those benefits she would otherwise have received under it. My grandfather has stated that he does not feel up to leaving his bed, said Lockhart. I think I can safely say the same for my step-grandmother. She is at present indisposed, and naturally my father's appearance here today, with all its consequences for her financially, might be said to chafe her more than a little. It was no more than the truth. A night spent rubbing the ropes that bound her hands up and down against the iron bedstead, had indeed chafed her, but she still persisted, while down in the study Mr. Taglioni repeated word for word what he had been taught. Mr. Taglioni stated that he had been employed as a casual labourer by the waterworks at the time, and being an Italian had naturally attracted the attention of Miss Flaws. 
I couldn't help it, he protested. I am Italian, and English ladies, well, you know how English ladies like. Lockhart intervened. I don't think we need go into any further details, he said specifically. Mr. Bulstrode expressed his fervent agreement. And you are prepared to swear on oath that to the best of your knowledge you are the father of this mine, he asked. Mr. Talioni said he was. Then if you'll just sign here, Mr. Bulstrode went on and handed him the pen. Mr. Talioni signed. His signature was witnessed by Dr. McGrew. My dear McGrew, said Mr. Bulstrode, I can only say that I now understand why the old man stipulated in his will that the bastard's father should be flogged to within an inch of his life. He must have had some inkling, you know. Dr. McGrew agreed. Personally, I would have preferred him to have stipulated something stronger, he said, like half a mile beyond it. To avoid disturbing his grandfather and distressing Mrs. Flores, Lockhart had decided to conduct the second part of the ceremony in the Peel Tower. When Bulstrode and McGrew entered, they found Mr. Talioni already manacled to the wall. What do you mean, flogged? He screamed. Mr. Dodd put a bullet in his mouth. I tell you I don't want to be flogged. I come here to stop for someone. I stop him. Now. Thank you, Mr. Dodd, said Mr. Bulstrode, as Dodd silenced the Italian with his grimy handkerchief. If anything persuades me that the will ought to be carried out according to the spirit of the law rather than the letter, it is his constant reference to stuffing. I find the term singularly objectionable, I must say. And was I not mistaken in thinking that the gender was wrong, too, said Dr. McGrew. I could have sworn, he said, him. Mr. Talioni would have sworn, too, if he could. Mr. Dodd's handkerchief, in combination with the bullet, was doing things to his taste buds and his breathing that took what was left of his mind off external circumstances. He turned from white to damson. I am still unpersuaded that we should proceed before determining the exact measurement of an inch of life, the doctor said. Perhaps we should consult Mr. Flaws himself to find out what precisely he meant. I doubt you'll get a rational answer out to the mine, said Mr. Dodd, all the while wondering which cassette would give an approximate answer to the question. He was saved the trouble by Dr. McGrew. Mr. Talioni's complexion had progressed from damson to off-black, I think it would be as well to allow your father some air, he told Lockhart. My Hippocratic oath will not allow me to attend death by suffocation. Of course, if this were a hanging... As Mr. Dodd removed the handkerchief and bullet, Mr. Talioni regained a better complexion and a volubility that was wasted on his audience. He stood shouting in Italian. Finally, unable to hear themselves dispute, Dr. McGrew and Mr. Bulstrode went out into the garden in disgust. I find his cowardice contemptible said Mr. Bulstrode, but the Italians fought very badly in the war. Which hardly helps us solve our present problem, said Dr. McGrew, and as a man of some compassion, even for such swine, I would suggest that we act in strict accordance to the will and flog the brute to within an inch of his life. Dr. McGrew went back into the hall and spoke to Mr. Dodd above the din. Presently Mr. Dodd left the hall and returned five minutes later with a ruler and a pencil. Dr. McGrew took them and approached Mr. Talioni. Placing the ruler an inch from his shoulder, and marking the point with the pencil, he proceeded down the Italian's right side, making pencil marks on the stucco wall, and joining them together so that they formed an outline one inch from the man. I think that is precise, he announced proudly. Lockhart, my boy, you may go ahead and flog the wall up to the pencil line, and you will have flogged the man to within an inch of his life. I think that satisfies to the letter the conditions of your grandfather's will. As Lockhart advanced with the whip, Mr. Talioni fulfilled the old man's last testament to the spirit. He slumped down the wall and was silent. Lockhart looked at him in annoyance. Why has he gone that funny colour? he asked. Dr. McGrew opened his bag and took out his stethoscope. A minute later he shook his head and pronounced Mr. Talioni dead. That's torn it, said Mr. Bulstrode. Now what the hell do we do? But the question was to remain unanswered for the time being. From within the house there came a series of terrible shrieks. Mrs. Flores had freed herself and had evidently discovered the full extent of her late husband's dismemberment. As they entered the hall, they saw Mrs. Flores standing at the top of the stairs. Woman's insane, said Dr. McGrew, unnecessarily, as Lockhart headed for the back stairs. Mrs. Flores was bawling about the old man being dead and not lying down. Go and see for yourselves, she cried and scuttled into her room. Dr. McGrew and Mr. Bulstrode went cautiously up the stairs. Not to mention the swine's death, said Dr. McGrew. I suppose we had better pay our compliments to Edwin. 
They turned towards old Mr. Flaws's bedroom, while at the foot of the stairs Mr. Dodd tried to dissuade them. He is not seeing anyone, he shouted. The truth of this remark escaped them. By the time Lockhart, coming stealthily up the back stairs to avoid being kicked in the groin by his demented mother-in-law, arrived, the landing was empty. Dr. McGrew had taken his stethoscope out and was applying it to Mr. Flaws's chest. It was not the wisest of moves. Mr. Flaws's subsequent ones were appalling to behold. Either the doctor's bedside manner or Mr. Bulstrode's accidental treading on the remote control activated the mechanism for the old man's partial animation. His arms waved wildly, the tiger's eyes rolled in his head, his mouth opened and shut, and his legs convulsed. Only the sound was off. The sound and the bedclothes, which his legs kicked off the bed so that the full extent of his rewiring was revealed. Mr. Talioni had not chosen the kindest spot for the wires to extrude, and they hung like some terrible electronic urethra. As Mr. Talioni had said at the time, it was the last place anyone examining him would think of looking. It was certainly the last place Dr. McGrew and Mr. Bulstrode wanted to look, but by the very complexity of the wires, they couldn't take their eyes off the thing. The junction box and earth, Lockhart explained, adding a cricketing term to their confusion, are the aerial. The amplifier is under the bed, and I've only got to turn the volume up. Don't, for God's sake, don't do anything of the sort, pleaded Mr. Bulstrode, unable to distinguish between spatial volume and output, and convinced that he was about to be privy to an erection. Mr. Flaws's reactions were awful enough without that dreadful addition. I've got him on ten watts per channel, Lockhart went on. But Dr. McGrew interrupted. As a medical man, I have never been in favor of euthanasia. He gasped, but there's such a thing as sustaining life beyond the bounds of human reason, and to wire a man's... Dear God! Ignoring Mr. Bulstrode's plea, Lockhart had turned the volume up. Besides twitching and jerking, the old man now gave voice. Was ever thus with us, he bellowed. A statement Dr. McGrew felt certain must be untrue. Flaws blood runs in our veins and carries with it the bacteria of our ancestral sins. Ay, sins and sanctity so intertwined, there's many a flaws gone to the block, a martyr to his forebears' loves and lusts. Would that it were not so, this determinism of inheritance, but I have known myself too well to doubt the urgency of my inveterate desires. Lockhart switched the old man off. And Dr. McGrew and Mr. Bulstrode breathed a sigh of terrible relief. It was short-lived. Lockhart had more in store for them. I had him stuffed, he said proudly. The new doctor proclaimed him healthy when he was already dead. As Dodd's my witness, so you did. Mr. Dodd nodded. I heard the doctor so proclaim, he said. Lockhart turned to Mr. Bulstrode. And you were instrumental in the killing of my father, he said. The sin of patricide. I did nothing of the sort, said the solicitor. I refuse. Did you or did you not draw up my grandfather's will? he asked. Mr. Bulstrode said nothing. Aye, you did. And thus we three all stand convicted of complicity in murder. I would have you consider the consequences carefully. Already it seemed to Dr. McGrew and Mr. Bulstrode that in Lockhart's voice they heard the unmistakable tone of the old man sitting stuffed beside them. The same unshakable arrogance and that dread logic, neither port, nor learned disputation, nor, now it seemed, even death, could totally dispel. They followed his instructions to the letter, and considered the consequences very well indeed. I must confess to finding myself perplexed, said Mr. Bulstrode, finally. As your grandfather's oldest friend, I feel bound to act to his best advantage, and in a way he would have liked. I doubt very much he would have liked being stuffed, said Dr. McGrew. I know I wouldn't. But on the other hand, as an officer of the law and a commissioner of oaths, I have my duty to perform. My friendship contradicts my duty. Now, if it were possible to say that Mr. Talioni died a natural death, he looked expectantly at Dr. McGrew. I can't believe a coroner would find the circumstances propitious to such a verdict. A man chained by his wrists to a wall may die a natural death, but he chose an unnatural position to do it in. There was a gloomy silence. Finally, Mr. Dodd spoke. Uh, we could add them to the contents of the cucumber flames, he said. The contents of the cucumber flames, said Dr. McGrew and Mr. Bulstrode simultaneously. But Lockhart ignored their curiosity. My grandfather expressed a wish not to be buried, he said, and I intend to see his wishes carried out. The two old men looked unwillingly at their dead friend. I cannot see him sitting to anyone's advantage in a glass case, 
Dr. Dr. McGrew, and it would be a mistake to suppose we can maintain the fiction of his life perpetually. I gathered that his widow knows. Mr. Dodd agreed with him. On the other hand, said Lockhart, we can always bury Mr. Taglioni in his place. Mr. Bulstrode and Dr. McGrew were of the same opinion. Then Mr. Dodd will find Grandfather a suitable sitting place, said Lockhart, and Mr. Taglioni will have the honour of joining the Flaw's ancestors at Black Puckrington. Dr. McGrew, I trust you have no objection to making out a death certificate of natural death for my grandfather. Dr. McGrew looked doubtfully at his stuffed patient. Let us just say that I won't let appearances to the contrary influence my judgment, he said. I suppose I could always put it that he shuffled off this mortal coil. A thousand natural shocks that flesh is air too would certainly seem to fit the case, said Mr. Bulstrode. And so it was agreed. Three days later, Lockhart caught the train from Newcastle, and by evening was back in Sandicate Crescent. There, everything had changed. The houses had all been sold, even Mr. O'Brain's, and the Crescent was once more its quiet, undisturbed suburban self. In Jessica's bank account, £695,000 nestled to her credit, the manager's effusiveness, and the great expectations of the chief collector of taxes, who could hardly wait to apply the regulations governing capital gains. Lockhart's million pounds in damages from Miss Goldring and her erstwhile publishers were lodged in a bank in the city, acquiring interest, but otherwise untouchable by the tax authorities, whose mandate did not allow them to lay hands on wealth obtained by such socially productive methods as gambling, filling in football pool coupons correctly, playing the horses, or winning £50,000 by investing £1 in premium bonds. Even bingo prizes remained inviolate. So, for the time being, did Jessica's fortune, and Lockhart intended it to remain that way. All you have to do, Lockhart told Jessica, is to see the manager and tell him you're withdrawing the entire sum in used one-pound notes. You understand? Jessica said she did, went down to the bank with a large empty suitcase. It was still large and empty when she returned. The manager won't let me, she said tearfully. He said it was inadvisable, and anyway I have to give a week's notice before I can withdraw money in my deposit account. Or oh, did he? said Lockhart. In that case we will go down again this afternoon and give him a week's notice. The meeting in the bank manager's office did not go smoothly. The knowledge that so valued a customer intended to ignore his advice and withdraw such an enormous sum in such small denominations had rubbed away a great deal of his effusiveness. In used one-pound notes, he said incredulously, you surely can't mean that. The work involved will go some way to making good the profit you have received from my wife's deposit, said Lockhart. You charge higher rates for overdrafts and you pay for deposits. They also have to return the money to customers when they require it, and in the legal tender they choose, contended Lockhart. My wife wants used one-pound notes. I can't imagine what for, said the manager. I would have thought it the height of folly for you to leave this building with a suitcase of untraceable notes. You might be robbed in the street. We might equally well be robbed in here, said Lockhart. But my way of thinking we have been by the discrepancy between your rates of interest. The value of that money has been depreciating thanks to inflation ever since you've had it. You won't deny that. Now, continued Lockhart, we will abide by your undertaking not to withdraw the money without giving you a week's notice, provided you let us have the money in used pound notes. I hope that is clear. Yes, said the manager, to whom it wasn't, but who didn't like the look on Mr. Flaws's face. If you will come in on Thursday, we'll be ready for you. Jessica and Lockhart went back to number 12 and spent the week packing. I think it would be best to send the furniture up by British Reel, said Lockhart. Why are you addressing that packing case to Mr. Jones in Edinburgh? asked Jessica. We don't know any Mr. Jones in Edinburgh. My love, said Lockhart, no more we do, and no more does British Reel. But I will be there at the station with a rented van to collect it, and I very much doubt if anyone will be able to trace us. You mean we're going to hide? said Jessica. Not hide said Lockhart. But since I have been classified as statistically and bureaucratically non-existent, and thereby ineligible to those benefits the welfare state is said to provide, I have not the slightest intention of providing the state with any of those benefits we have been able to accrue. In short, not one penny in income tax, not one penny in capital gains tax, and not one penny in anything. I don't exist, and being non-existent, intend to reap my reward." And so, by the following Thursday, the contents of the house had been packed and dispatched to Edinburgh by British Rail to be collected there by Mr. Jones, and it only remained to go to the bank and fill the suitcase with the used one-pound notes. Lockhart had already withdrawn his million in the same form from his bank in the city.
the same time, Mrs. Flores was following a gold trail from the hall, and every few yards along the path she stopped to pick up another gold sovereign. The head of her Mr. Dodd walked steadily, and every so often dropped another from the late Mr. Taglioni's reimbursement. By the time he had covered a thousand yards, he had dropped two hundred sovereigns on the path. After that, he lengthened the space to twenty yards. Still Mrs. Flores, oblivious to all else, followed, muttering greedily to herself. By the two thousand yard mark, Mr. Dodd had dropped two hundred and fifty, and Mrs. Flores had picked up as many. At three thousand yards, Mr. Dodd had still seven hundred sovereigns left in the wash leather bag. He paused beneath a sign which said, Danger, Ministry of Defence, Firing Range, Entry Strictly Forbidden, and considered its message and the morality of his action. Then observing the mist that drifted across the artillery range, and being a man of honour, decided that he must proceed. He dropped more coins, this time closer together to quicken the pace. At 4,000 yards, he was down to 500 sovereigns, and at 5,000, the wash leather bag still held 400. And as the money thickened on the ground, so did the mist above it. At 8,000 yards, Mr. Dodd emptied the remnants on the ground, scattering them in the heather to be searched for, Then he turned and ran. Mrs. Flores was nowhere to be seen, but her demented muttering came through the mist. If this trail of bullion continued, she would be a rich woman. Mrs. Flores foresaw a splendid future. She would leave the hall. She would live in luxury with yet another husband, a young one this time, to be bullied and put to work and made to serve her sexual requirements. Four thousand yards to the south, the men of the Royal Artillery were equally determined not to miss their target. They couldn't see it, but the range was right, and having bracketed it, they prepared to fire a salvo. Ahead of them, Mrs. Flores found the last coin and sat on the ground with the gold gathered in her skirt and began to count. One, two... Three, four, five. She got no further. The Royal Artillery had lived up to their reputation, and the six-gun salvo had scored a direct hit. Where Mrs. Flores had been sitting, there was a large crater, around whose perimeter lay scattered, like golden confetti from some extravagant wedding, one thousand sovereigns. Dodd was playing his pipes when the sound of a horn blown from the locked gate on the bridge sent him running down the drive to welcome Lockhart and his wife. The floors is are back at the hall, he said, as he opened the gate. It's a grand day. Aye, it's good to be back for good, said Lockhart. That evening, Lockhart dined at his grandfather's place at the oval mahogany table with Jessica sitting opposite him. By candlelight, she looked more innocent and lovely than ever, and Lockhart lifted his glass to her. He had come into his gift, and the knowledge that he was now truly head of the floors family freed him from the imposed chasteness of the past. Later, while Mr. Dodd played a gay tune of his own composing to celebrate the occasion, Lockhart and Jessica lay not only in one another's arms, but something more. Such was their happiness that it was not until after a late breakfast that any mention was made of Mrs. Flores's absence. I haven't seen her since yesterday, said Mr. Dodd. She was away across the fell and in rather better spirits than of late. But Jessica was too enchanted by the house to miss her mother. She went from room to room, looking at the portraits and the fine old furniture, and making plans for the future. I think we'll have the nursery in Grandfather's old dressing room, she told Lockhart. Don't you think that would be a good idea? Then we'll have Baby near us. Lockhart agreed with everything she suggested. His mind was on other things than babies. He and Mr. Dodd conferred in the study. You put the money in the wall with the man, he asked. Aye, the trunk of the suitcases are well hidden, said Mr. Dodd. But you said that no one will come looking. But I cannot be certain, said Lockhart, and it's necessary to prepare for contingencies, and I do not intend to be dispossessed of my gains. If they cannot find the money, they can seize the house and everything in it. I have mind to prepare for that eventuality in advance. I'll have a word with Mr. Bulstrode first. He always dealt with my grandfather's tax problems. You'll go to the telephone in Puckrington and send for him. Next day, Mr. Bulstrode arrived to find Lockhart sitting at the desk in the study, and it seemed to the solicitor that a more than subtle change had come over the young man he had known as the bastard. I would have you know, Bulstrode, said Lockhart, when they had exchanged preliminaries, that I have no intention of paying death duties on their estate. Mr. Bulstrode cleared his throat. I think we can find a way to avoid any large assessment, he said. The estate has always run at a loss. Your grandfather tended to deal only in cash without receipt, and besides, I have a certain influence with Wyman, Her Majesty's tax collector. You need have no fear he'll trouble you or much. He'll not trouble me at all. Troll be t'other way round if he so much as sets foot on Flaw's fell. <laughs>
You'll tell them, mate. Mr. Bulstrode foresaw dire days ahead. Finally, with a silent prayer that Mr. Wyman would listen to reason and not invite disaster, he left. But there were forces already at work to nullify the hope expressed in Mr. Bulstrode's prayer. Mr. Wyman was quite prepared to listen to reason next morning when the solicitor delivered his warning, but Her Majesty's Collector of Taxes for the Middle Marches was no longer in control of the situation. In London, the far more formidable figure in the person of Mr. Merkin, Senior Collector, Super Tax Division, Sub-Department, Evasion of. Uh, the Inland Revenue Offices had been alerted to the possibility that Mr. and Mrs. Flores, previously of number 12, Sandicott Crescent, now of no known address, had withdrawn £659,000 and used £1 notes with the intention of not paying capital gains tax. This had been brought to his notice by the bank manager of the East Pursley branch of Jessica's Bank, who happened to be a close friend of Mr. Merkin, and who had been piqued by her refusal to accept his advice. He had been more than piqued by Lockhart's attitude. In his opinion, something very fishy was going on. In the opinion of Mr. Merkin, it was more than fishy. It stank. Mr. Merkin arrived at Walk and was directed via Black Pockrington to Floors Hall. There he met his first obstacle in the shape of the locked gate of the bridge over the cut. Using the intercom which Lockhart had installed, he spoke to Mr. Dodd. Mr. Dodd was polite and said he would see if his master was at home. There's a man from the inland revenue down at the bridge, he told Lockhart, who was sitting in the study. He says he's the senior collector of taxes. You'll not be wanting to speak to him. Lockhart did speak. He went to the intercom and asked Mr. Merkin by what right he was trespassing on private property. By my right as senior collector of taxes, said Mr. Merkin, and the question of private property does not arise. I'm entitled to visit you to inquire into your financial affairs. As he spoke, Mr. Dodd left the house by way of the kitchen garden and crossed the fell to the dam. Mr. Merkin, by this time too irate to observe the landscape, continued his argument with Lockhart. Will you or will you not come down and unlock this gate? he demanded. If you don't, I shall apply for a warrant. What is your answer? I shall be down in just a moment, said Lockhart. I have an idea it's going to rain and I'll need an umbrella. Mr. Merkin looked up into a cloudless sky. What the hell do you mean you'll need an umbrella? he shouted into the intercom. There's not a sign of rain. Oh, I don't know, said Lockhart. We get very sudden changes of weather in these parts. I have known it to pour down without warning. At that moment, Mr. Dodd undid the main sluice gates at the base of the dam, and a white wall of water issued from the great pipes. Ten feet high, it hurtled down the cut, just as Mr. Merkin was about to protest that he had never heard such nonsense in his life. Mr. Merkin stood and looked aghast. The next moment he was running hell for leather past his car and up the metalled track towards Black Pockrington. He was too late. The wall of water was less than ten feet deep now, but of sufficient depth to sweep the car and the senior collector of taxes off their tyres and feet and carry them a quarter of a mile down the valley and into the tunnel. I don't till they come and bike the same way, Dodd told Lockhart, who had observed the collector's submergence with relish. I wouldn't be too sure, said Lockhart, while Jessica out of the kindness of her heart, hoped the poor man could swim. There was no kindness in Mr. Merkin's heart by the time he had issued from the tunnel, and having been bounced, bashed, trundled, and sucked through several large pipes and two deep tanks, finally came to rest, the comparative calm of the subsidiary reservoir beyond Tombstone Law. Half drowned and badly grazed, and with murder in his heart, not to mention water everywhere, he clambered up the granite bank and staggered toward a farmhouse. The rest of the way to Hexham he travelled by ambulance and was lodged in the hospital there, suffering from shock, multiple abrasions, and dementia taxitis. Mr. Merkin was not the only person to suffer. The discovery of the late Mrs. Flores in a shell crater surrounded by gold sovereigns came as a shock to Jessica. Poor mummy, she said, when an officer from the Royal Artillery brought her the sad news. She never had much bump of direction, and it's nice to know she didn't suffer. You did say death was instantaneous. Absolutely! said the officer. We bracketed her first, and then all six guns fired the salvo, and we were bang on target. And you say she was surrounded by sovereigns? asked Jessica. That would have made her very proud. She always was a great admirer of the royal family, and to know that they were with her in her hour of need is a wonderful comfort. She left the officer in a state of some perplexity, and went about the more urgent business of nest-making. She was two weeks pregnant. It was left to Lockhart to offer his apologies to the Major for the inconvenience caused by Mrs. Flores's failure to look where she was going. I'd be happy to have you put your warning notices up a bit closer to the house and on my ground, he told the Major. It would keep people from interfering with my game. <laughs>
what the game was, he kept to himself. But the Major was touched by his generosity. I'll have to get permission from the Ministry, he said. But isn't there anything else we can do to help? Well, as a matter of fact, there is, said Lockhart. Next day, Lockhart drove to Newcastle with the trailer behind the car, and when he returned, both car and trailer were loaded to the brim with fresh electronic equipment. He made two subsequent trips, and each time came back with more bits and pieces. Oh, Lockhart, said Jessica, it's so nice to know you've got a hobby. There you are in your workshop, and here am I making everything ready for baby. What was that huge machine that came up yesterday? An electric generator, said Lockhart. I've decided to electrify the house. But to watch him and Mr. Dodd at work on the floors fell, suggested that it was less the house than the surrounding countryside that Lockhart had decided to electrify. As each day passed, they dug fresh holes, and deposited loudspeakers in them, and wired them together. Two days later, Lockhart, finally accepting the Major's offer of help, spent several hours on the artillery range with a tape recorder listening to the guns being fired. I say, I think it's an ingenious idea, said the Major as Lockhart packed his equipment into the car, prepared to leave. Sort of bird scarer, what? You could put it like that, said Lockhart, and thanking him once again, drove away. He returned to the hall to find Mr. Dodd waiting for him with the news that he had what was needed to make the scene realistic. We'll just have to be sure the sheep don't tread in them, he said. But Lockhart was of a different opinion. A dead sheep or two won't come amiss. They'll add a touch of death to the scene. A few bullocks would, too. All the while, Mr. Merkin hobbled about Hexham on crutches and spent hours poring over the tax returns of old Mr. Flaws in the determination to find proof of something that would justify the issue of a warrant. Mr. Merkin found what he wanted. The A.T. excise men needed no warrant to enter and search an Englishman's house, be it castle or cot, at any time of the day or night, and their powers, unlike his own, were not subject to the limitations of magistrates, courts of law, or any of the legal institutions which preserved an Englishman's supposed liberties. And so several weeks passed, and as many letters from the customs and excise were sent and received no reply. Faced with this flagrant contempt for his office and the VAT regulations, the head VAT man decided to act. And during those weeks, Lockhart and Mr. Dodd continued with their preparations. They moved more equipment into the valley and onto the fells surrounding the hall. They installed numbers of tape recorders and enormously powerful amplifiers in the hall and waited for the next move. It came with the arrival of Mr. Bulstrode and Dr. McGrew, the solicitor to inform Lockhart that he had learnt through Mr. Wyman that the excise men intended to raid the house that night, and Dr. McGrew to confirm that Jessica was expecting a baby. Neither of them expected what happened that night, when after an excellent dinner they went to bed in their old rooms at Floors Hall. Also be true to say that the excise men had no idea what to expect. They had been warned by Mr. Merkin's experience, but as they stole across the dam, all seemed quiet and peaceful under the brilliant moon. They were still a hundred yards from the hall when the barrage broke around them, and barrage it was. A thousand loudspeakers bombarded them acoustically with a roar of shells, rapid machine gun fire, screams of agony, bombs, fresh screams, larger shells, and a high-pitched whistle of such appalling frequency that several sheep went immediately insane. The excise men tried desperately to take cover, only to find that lying down was even more awful than standing up from the sound point of view. Worse still, it prevented them from getting out of the way of maddened sheep and demented bullocks, startled out of their senses into panic by the terrible din. Even in the house where Dr. McGrew and Mr. Bulstrode had been warned that it might be more advisable to sleep with their heads under pillows rather than on top, the sounds of battle were devastating. Only Lockhart, Jessica and Mr. Dodd enjoyed what was happening. Provided with earplugs, specially designed ear mufflers and sound-deadening helmets, they were in a privileged position. Mr. Merkin, clutching his head in agony, took an unwise step forward, fell, and lay on an extremely large loudspeaker, which was resonating at an extremely low frequency. Before he knew what was happening, Mr. Merkin was transformed from senior collector of taxes of the Inland Revenue into a sort of semi-human tuning fork one end of which felt as if it had been sucked into a jet engine at full power, while the middle, lying on top of the low-frequency loudspeaker, began to rumble, stir, reverberate, and bounce quite horribly. Mr. Merkin's plastered legs simply vibrated involuntarily and at a frequency that was not at all to the advantage of what lay between their upper ends. Around him, the fell was clear. Sheep, bullocks, hounds, and excise men, all deaf to everything but the pain in their ears, had fled the field and had scampered back across the dam. As they finally disappeared from view, Lockhart turned the amplifiers off. The bombardment ceased suddenly as it had begun. 
not that Mr. Merkin or the fleeing excise men either knew or cared. They were in a soundless world in any case. By the time they reached their cars on the road and were able to voice their shattered feelings, they were unable to get them heard. Lockhart went into the Peel Tower and lit the fire in the great hearth. As it blazed up, he told Mr. Dodd to fetch the whiskey and went himself into the house to invite Mr. Bulstrode and Dr. McGrew to join him and Jessica in drinking a toast. Mr. Dodd was already there with the whiskey and his pipes. Standing in a little group beneath the battle flags and the swords, they raised their glasses. What are we going to drink to this time? asked Jessica. And it was Mr. Dodd who supplied the answer. To the devil himself, he said. Devil, said Jessica. Why the devil? Why, aye, honey, said Mr. Dodd. It's clear you don't ken your Robbie Burns. You don't ken his poem, The Deals of War with the Excise Mine. They danced and drank and drank and danced. Then, exhausted, sat round the long table while Jessica made them ham and eggs. When they had finished, Lockhart stood up and told Mr. Dodd to fetch the man. As dawn broke over Floors Fell, Mr. Dodd flung open the gates of the Peel Tower, and the old Mr. Floors, seated in a wheelchair and manifestly self-propelled, rolled into the room and took his accustomed place at the end of the table. Mr. Dodd shut the doors and handed Lockhart the remote control. Lockhart twiddled with the switches, and once again the room rang with the voice of old Mr. Floors. I've not a forelock left to touch and witness ease a finger to it, had I one, to wheedle pennies from a foreign swine, be he an Arab sheik of the Emperor of Japan. I am true-born English to the core, and so I will remain. So keep your whimpering for women folk, and let me have my bang. And as if in answer to this request, there was a dull explosion in his innards, and smoke poured out of his ears. Mr. Bulstrode and Dr. McGrew looked on appalled, while Lockhart, trying the switches, shouted to Mr. Dodd, The fire extinguisher! He yelled, For God's sake, get the fire extinguisher! But it was no good. Mr. Flores was living up to his promise not to whimper. Flailing round him with his arms and shouting incomprehensible imprecations from his clapper mouth, he streaked in his wheelchair across the banqueting hall, gathered a rug over his feet on the way, bounced off an armoured figure, and finally, with that practicality he had always admired in his ancestors, shot into the open hearth and burst into flames. By the time Mr. Dodd arrived with the fire extinguisher, he was beyond extinction, and had flared up the chimney in a shower of sparks and flames. Almost a Viking's funeral, said Dr. McGrew, as the charred remains flaked to ashes and the last transistor melted. It had been made in Japan, he noted, which tended to contradict the old man's final boast that he was English to the core. He was about to point out this interesting anatomical and philosophical observation to Mr. Bulstrode when he was interrupted by a cry from behind him. Lockhart was standing on the oak table among the guttering candles, and tears were running down his cheeks. The deal has pity in him yet, thought the doctor. Mr. Dodd, recognizing the symptoms, picked up his pipes and squeezed the bag under his arm as Lockhart began his dirge. The last of them all is gone for the hall, and the falls is fled for the fell. But those that are left can I recall the tales she used to tell. To a death she died, to a life she led, to a man he might have been. The in speak words she had but read, the other he did na mean. And so he struggled his whole life through, and never in strife he ceased. And he all sought what was good and true, though his self do be half a beast. While Mr. Dodd squeezed on with his tune, Lockhart jumped down from the table and left the Peel Tower. Jessica was about to follow Lockhart out, and Mr. Dodd stopped her. I am be by his cell, honey, he said, again to diddy his weird the whale. Senior Collector of Taxes, Super Tax Division, Sub-Department, Evasion of, was in hospital outwardly unscathed, but suffering internally the simultaneous after-effects of extremely low-frequency waves. His condition baffled the doctors, who could make neither head nor tail of his symptoms. One end he fluttered, the other end he wowed. The combination was one they had never previously encountered, and it was only with the arrival of Dr. McGrew, who suggested plastering his plastered legs together to stop them oscillating, that Mr. Merkin could be kept in bed. Even so, he wowed, his most insistent wow being to have his Schedule D, 
a demand that led to some confusion with the vitamin. In the end, he was gagged, and his head encased in lead-filled ice bags to stop it vibrating. He's clean off his rocker, said Dr. McGrew gratuitously, as the senior collector bounced on the bed. The best and safest place for him would be a padded cell. Besides, it would keep the rumble down. Dr. McGrew signed a committal order to the local mental hospital on the perfectly sensible grounds that a man whose extremities were so clearly at odds with one another and who seemed to have lost his memory was suffering from incurably split personality. And so, with that anonymity that was entirely in keeping with his profession as a tax collector, Mr. Merkin, now a mere digit himself, was taken at public expense and registered under Schedule D in the most padded and soundless of cells. Meanwhile, the excise man and the head VAT man were too taken up with their own loss of hearing to consider with any enthusiasm a return visit to Floors Hall. They spent their time writing notes to one another and to their solicitors concerning the actions for damages which they were bringing against the Ministry of Defence for failing to draw their attention to the fact that they were on the night of the raid entering an artillery range. The case was a prolonged one, made longer still by the Army's adamant denial that they fired at night and by the need for all cross-examination of the excise men to be done in longhand. Meanwhile, life at Floors Hall resumed its quiet routine. There, too, things had changed. The cucumbers in the frames grew larger than Mr. Dodd had ever known them to, and Jessica expanded likewise. But all summer long, the bees in the straw hives buzzed over the heather, and young rabbits gambled outside warrens. Even the foxes, sensing the changed atmosphere, returned, and for the first time in many a year, curlews called over Floors Fell. Life was returning, and Lockhart had given up his previous desire to shoot things. Jessica had broadened out to a homely woman with a sharp tongue in her head, and the Sandicott strain had reasserted itself. It was a practical strain that placed some value on comfort. The hall had been transformed. It once again became the centre of social life in the Middle Marches. Mr. Bulstrode and Dr. McGrew still came to dinner, but so did neighbours whom Jessica invited. And in late November, when the snow lay in thick drifts against the dry stone walls, she gave birth to a son. We all name him after his grandfather said Lockhart, as Jessica nursed the baby. We don't know who he is, darling, said Jessica. Lockhart said nothing. It was true that they still had no idea who his father was, and he had been thinking of his own grandfather when he spoke. We'll leave the christening until the spring, when the roads are clear, and we can have everyone over for the ceremony. But for the time being, the newborn floors remained almost anonymous, and as bureaucratically non-existent as his father, while Lockhart spent much of his time in Perkins' lookout. The little folly perched on the corner of the high wall served as his study, where he could sit and look through its stained-glass window over the garden. Down below, in a warm, sunlit corner of the miniature garden, Mr. Dodd, as happy as a skylark, sat by the pram of Edwin Tyndale floors, played his pipes or sang his songs, while his grandson lay and chuckled with sheer delight.